Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. Today's podcast is different than all of our other podcasts because it was recorded remotely due to the pandemic. I was in our studio in Phoenix, and my guest, David Frum, was across the country in Washington. And now here I am at home recording this introduction after the fact. Nevertheless, despite all those difficulties, the discussion itself was fascinating and particularly timely. Frum has written a book recently, Trumpocalypse, describing his impression not just of the last three years of the Trump administration, but more importantly, his reflections on its relationship to democracy and his concern about the future of democracy in this country and how to get beyond the current administration. Now, what makes this particularly interesting is that Frum himself is a conservative commentator with well-known credentials. He was a speechwriter, after all, for George W. Bush. And we talked very widely, not just about the history of conservatism and, and democracy in this country, but also about various aspects of the Bush administration and the 20 years between then and now. The discussion was extremely wide-ranging and incredibly interesting because of his experience and knowledge, uh, both as someone trained as a historian and, and lawyer, who be later became a journalist, and also because of his background. Uh, we share a commonality that uh, we talked about at the beginning. We both grew up in Toronto and moved to the United States as young adults with vastly different politics. But our experiences there versus here color, I think, both of our views of of, of uh, political systems and the world, uh, differing as they do. But the fact that we've come together at the current time and agree on so many things where earlier we certainly disagreed on many, many aspects of, of, of politics is a reflection of the incredibly interesting, shall I say, time that we're in and makes this discussion particularly worth listening to. I genuinely enjoyed the discussion. I... Uh, I uh, pulled no punches, and David was able to respond in, in kind, and uh, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Well, David, it is a thrill to be with you, if, if at least across the country from you and, and virtually with you after uh, it's been a long time that I wanted to talk to you. Well, well thank you. It's such a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and I realize that I don't know if people are watching this as opposed to hearing it, but this is actually a conversation between three Canadians, because not only am I here and you here, but over your right shoulder, I think I see an image of William Shatner. Yes, that's right. Another Canadian. All famous Americans are Canadian, I used to say, but... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's going to, this is, it's going to go all over the place because you have had a remarkable career and um, you've written a new book, which we'll talk about, but this isn't just about that. This is about your ideas, which I think uh, are worth discussing because they're, they're so uh, deep and, and um, really hit at the nuances of American life in a way that I haven't seen before. I want to bracket the interview with two quotes from you. One from uh, your book, The Right Man, where you said, um, with his axis of evil speech, President Bush sent a message to the world. He felt no guilt and no self-doubt. At the time, you said you consider that a compliment. We'll come back to that. Then, uh, in the new book, in Trumpocalypse, which I might as well, since I might as well be a good host. Thank you. There we go. Um, which is a great, great read. You, uh, you said, I came of age in in the conservative movement in, of the 20th century. In the 21st century, that movement has delivered more harm than good, from the Iraq war to the financial crisis to the Trump presidency. So that that transformation between what I, a sort of a syncophantic praise of President Bush to a criticism of the movement, which, which is largely, I will argue, and may, we can disagree about this, his legacy, Having said that, I also, for full disclosure, I have to have to put myself in perspective. Two decades ago, when I knew when I heard about you, I kind of visceral, I had a visceral response. I despised what everything you said. Okay, make that clear. And that's changed to someone who's whose views. I think I think you probably brilliantly and bravely present the the harsh light of reality on the U United States more accurately than any any commentator I've read or see either in this book or online. So we've come a long way. At least I've come a long way in my appreciation of you. And I want to just 
say how we both agree. Um, I, I think the following statement we'll both agree upon. So I want to get it out of the way. Just to say Bush is a postule on the backside of the nation, democracy, and humanity, and also presents the greatest danger to democracy that we've had in U.S. history. Did I overstate that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you said Bush when you meant Trump. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Trump. Yeah, I, I, I confused the two, as you'll see. Yes. I meant Trump. Uh, uh, look, I think it's, it's true of anybody who's lived a life of the mind, like our late friend Christopher Hitchens, that the story of your life is one both of continuities and of discontinuities. Um, and the story of your life is of continuities you see, continuities you don't see, discontinuities you see, and discontinuities you don't see. Um, and we're not always the best analyst um, of our own life, uh, which is unfortunate because oftentimes we're the only analyst there is because who else cares? Yeah. Um, so uh, when I look back, you mentioned the Bush years. Um, the, the, the right man, uh, that was not the working title for the book. The, the book um, about the Bush presidency, I mean, Bush was in many ways a person not to my taste. We would never have been friends had we ever met on an equal footing. Um, and I uh, had not supported his nomination in 2000. I'd been a McCain advocate. And in that book, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of doubts, uh, some of which at the time I suppressed, uh, some of which I felt and expressed, um, some of which were sort of rattling around at the back of my head in nonverbal ways and that sort of manifest themselves in the book. Uh, but like you, um, I've had a critical engagement with the United States my whole life. And that is the one great intellectual continuity, I think, is that um, I'm a child of, even more than of the conservative world, I'm a child of the Cold War. I was born in 1960. Um, so many of the important memories of my life are associated with the decisive moments of the Cold War. My late father, who's a great art collector, he bought his first important piece of art um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He couldn't afford it at all. Um, he paid for it by check. And as he later explained the story, that what he thought was, by the time the check cleared, um, he would either be dead <laughs> or else he would be so happy to be alive that he would find some way to pay the, <laughs> to cover the check. <laughs> that is perfect. And the, the painting he bought now hangs in... Um, uh, my house in, in, in Canada. Oh, that's uh, lovely. And, and, uh, so I, I, we grew up under that protection. Um, uh, the, the, all the possibilities of our lives or my life were formed by that great fact of the American security and the American world trading system. I came from a family that was a border family and mingled by Canadian. And so I've had this critical engagement with the United States, uh, my whole life. And where, where sometimes I'm thinking, why can't Canada be more like the United States? And at other times, why can't the United States be more like Canada? Um, and, and that, that has been a theme through, through all the books. Um, I don't, when you talk about Donald Trump, the person, I mean, I've, obviously, I mean, he's a, he's a worthless human being. Um, and I, there's nothing good you can say about him. And that's unique among American presidents, even among the predecessors, even the worst. Yeah. You know, the slaveholders, the racists. Uh, the, the, John Tyler was a traitor. He served in the Confederate Congress. But John Tyler, traitor though he was, was an extremely affectionate father. Uh, uh, Andrew Jackson and Andrew Johnson, um, racist though they were, were men of great physical courage. Um, Rich, Richard Nixon, um, you know, was, was in many ways a criminal, but a profound intellect and, and, and a, a serious writer. Um, uh, James Buchanan, commonly thought of as the worst president in American history, the president on the eve of the Civil War who didn't fortify the arsenals of the United States against Confederate treason. James Buchanan was well-traveled, well-informed, well-read. And uh, <laughs> Warren Harding, fun at a party. <laughs> <laughs> There's just nothing you can say about this guy. I, I was wondering, yeah. have you tried to find something good to say? I I, mean, there was, I, there was, it, when he ran for president, I had one good thing to say about him, which is, uh, it's no longer true, but when he ran for president, the one thing I could say was he never pretended to be a better person than he was. Um, but since he became president, and he, since he's begun hanging out with evangelicals, he's yeah. begun pretending to be pious and godly. And, and so he's given away even that one um, that one piece of credit, which is, um, you know, he, he, he take him at, you can take him at face value. All of that to say, though, um, my two books about Donald Trump, Trumpocracy and Trumpocalypse, both try to stay away from the question of his personality. Yeah. Because I'm not interested in 
further enumerating all the ways that he's a bad person. Yeah, that, bad that's why I wanted to begin this by just accepting that he's a bad person. Yeah. I want to say, why wasn't he screened out? The whole mm -hmm. point of this insanely complex political system in the United States is to screen out people like this. Why didn't it work? Yeah, and that's, I think, and that's a great question, and we'll get to that. I, Interestingly, you've sort of anticipated where I came from. This is uh, the Origins podcast, and I want to first begin, actually, by discussing your origins. You gave a really great sort of brief introduction, but, but again, I want to go back even further for you, and also for me, because I want to explain to some extent the the context of some of the questions I'm going to ask and why I had that visceral interaction because I kind of always felt even though we really didn't get to know each other un until indirectly through our mutual friend Christopher Hitchens and late after he died we had a connection we both grew up in Toronto in nice Jewish boys from Toronto um, the uh, although slightly different side of the tracks I would say but in any case the we both moved to the United States for school I didn't go. I never even thought of the United States as an undergraduate. You went to as an undergraduate to Yale. I, I went to do my PhD at MIT, and that brought us to the United States. Interestingly enough, I've been reading, and I think this is true, and when you were age 14, you were, you were campaigning for a new Democratic candidate. For the Americans, that's kind of a socialist candidate in, in, in Canada. That's right? Yes. And interestingly enough, when I was age 14, I campaigned for a conservative candidate in, in, in Canada at the time. And then, the same, so we're already... This is we the 75 were, election? Uh, 75 yeah. Ontario? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, same election. Yeah. And, and, um, and so we were on opposite ends of the political spectrum then, and then we reversed because you, you came and became what at the time I thought of as an apologist for the Republican Party, and we can discuss that. I became a kind of left-wing radical. At the same time... I grew up with your mother. So did you, but mm -hmm. so did all Canadians in a way. Uh, when I was in college, I would come home from class every single day so I could listen to As It Happens to hear your mother, St. Barbara, and who tragically died in 1982, and I guess at the, the year Clinton was elected. And, and I kind of felt, I, I, I got the sense she certainly wasn't a political conservative, and how she reacted to your growing conservatism. I have no sense of myself as a self-made person. Um, I would not be what I am, who I am, where I am, uh, without the advantages that, um, and the, some of the challenges that came from my, my upbringing. Um, my late mother used to, um, quote, I didn't know it was a quote, uh, I, I, later I learned it was a quote, the, the opening paragraph of the great Gatsby that whenever you're temp tempted to criticize anybody in life, remember that not everybody's had all the advantages that you've had. And in the book, that's a more, that's, that's a sentence soaked in double and triple meanings, but in her speech, it, it just had one. My mother, who was born in 1937, was diagnosed with fatal cancer in 1974 at the age of 37, and she was told she had a year or two to live. Um, now, modern medical science kept improving, and so she got more time, but she never got a big, she, she lived for 18 more years after 1974, but she didn't, never got a sense of, hey, you have 18 years to live. She got a sense of, you have two years to live nine times. And that sense of doom overhung uh, my family. And so although we had, um, we were very prosperous we had many, and became more so, we had many material advantages and we were, my parents were both very cultured people and it was a very, very loving and close marriage. Um, and I led in many ways a sheltered life. It was a sheltered life always overhung <laughs> yeah. by doom. Do you think, I know someone else who, a good old friend of mine, Stephen Hawking, who, who yeah. felt he had one year to live for 50 years, yeah, and his productivity and his and his contributions increased after he was diagnosed. Yeah. Maybe because of the urgency of living, do you, did did that have impact yeah. on on your mother's yeah. sort of the, oh, the yeah. incredible? So, so she was energy. determined to squeeze every, every bit of juice out of that fruit, and so she was a the American listeners won't know, but she was this gigantic presence in media um, where she was. Sim simultaneously um, a Ted Koppel figure, the country's leading, or Bra Jim Lee, yeah. the country's leading interviewer, but she was also kind of Walter Cronkite figure because she, um, she epitomized news values in a country where because um, everything is just poorer in Canada than it is in the United States, there's less margin. And so people in media tend to make compromises just to put food on their table. And, and uh, because of the advantages in her life, she never had to even consider that. She never did commercials. She never did endorsements. Uh, she never did any commercial activity. Um, she wouldn't hang out with, she would, um, 
she never associated with politicians. Um, that the she was never she never in her entire career. I don't think she ever had so much as a cup of tea at the house of the prime minister, or the premier of Ontario. She just such a difference from from journalists nowadays. Yeah, um, and that was a real point to her that she did yeah. not know them. She did not know them socially. There's one story, an amazing story, where your mother got in trouble as a journalist, which I read about uh, in preparation for this. There was a shooting in in, uh, in at University of Montreal. Um, yeah. A young engineering student, I think, had killed, shot, and stabbed fourteen women, and yeah. he was decrying women and feminism. And she basically spoke out and said, "Why do you limit? Don't think of this as limited to a group. It's not an attack on feminism. It's an attack on everyone." And people, mm -hmm. as far as I know, she got in real trouble for that. I don't know if you if you want to come. I remember that very well because of her mortality, she was tremendously aware of suffering and tragedy. She used to say, and this is a saying I have adopted in my life, that about life, there are those who know and those who don't know. And what you know is pain um, and the nearness of pain. And she knew that and she taught us to know it. But what she had then a tremendous aversion to was anyone who tried to use pain for a purpose. And that was what um, I think offended her about the reaction to the events in Montreal in 1989. I think it, there, I brought it up not just because I'm fascinated by your mother as well, which I am, and it was clear she was a great conversationalist. I used to listen she's to her fascinating. Every, yeah, every she's night, but I'm, I'm she's fascinated just the most by... She's ex extraordinarily but, fascinating person. Yeah, but you're fascinating, which is what I want to get to, I, I think. And um, uh, one of the reasons I want I brought up that story is because one of the issues that goes hand in hand with the with the Trump presidency. I don't think it's a consequence so much, although I think it's been exacerbated by it, as we'll talk about, and you elaborate on this, is this, is this, is this polarization and the use of things to create us versus them views of the world. And that's one of the reasons actually why I wanted to also have this podcast. I, and it's poetic to me. Another connection we had, as we say, is Christopher Hitchens. And it was really Christopher who taught me something which is so important which is it's it, you can have good discussions and have good friendships with people with whom you com disagree about a tremendous number of things it's mm -hmm. okay and i say that because when i announced on twitter that you and i were going to have a uh, do a podcast i got a response by the way you're the only person that I've ever announced in advance that I was going to have a podcast with, just so you're aware. But in any case... Honored. Well, and, and it was interesting to see. And maybe it would have happened for some of the other people, but I don't think so. You can imagine what I got from... Because I, I probably followed by more of left-wing people that I, I, got, I got immediately unfollowed. I got all these people unfollow. How could you give this person a voice? And this notion that you're not allowed to have any conversation with people if they disagreed you, with you about anything ever... And I remember Christopher, uh, you know, he was a friend of, of Justice Scalia, a person, you know, uh, who indirectly I have connections with. My niece was uh, uh, a clerk for him at the Supreme Court, um, but who's someone whose views I need, I guess it's clear I disagreed with in almost every way. Uh, and, and Christopher was going to film a thing with me, Scalia and him, and it would have been a remarkable thing, but he died, Christopher died. But that fact, and I thought, well, well, this is what we should be doing as a society, and it comes to what you're. We'll come back to this at the end of the interview because it's at the end of at the end of your book. This notion that we, if we can't come together at some level and have discussions after the crisis that is the the Trump presidency, then the mm -hmm. nation is in real trouble. Well, thank you. Let me express some sympathy for the people who are treating those angry messages at you. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously, it's bad to be doctrinaire and rigid. Um, it's also true, and I found this very much in the Trump years. I mean, I have lots of friends with whom I have lots of disagreements, but I found in the Trump years, I have rather fewer of them. Because sometimes there are disagreements that are about how intellectual matters, how you see the world. And so there are people who just have other views, and then and, you know, people have arguments over that. Um, that there are um, large issues of principle, like with Scalia. I mean, Justice Scalia was a devout Catholic. That was the basis of a lot of his vision of the world. He would deny it was the basis of his jurisprudence, but... I think it, he said it. it. No, he once said, he once said the law, you know, uh, the authority of law comes from God. Right. And so Christopher, who didn't believe in God, couldn't believe that. But, yeah, but you know, let's put it this way. I mean, that... Um, it's not, it's not an insane proposition that the authority of law comes from God. Most people who've thought about law over the centuries have believed that. Um, so uh, 
You know, it's, that's, 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 not, um, that's not crazy. Uh, you might think it was wrong, but, um, but then there are things, I mean, and this has happened in, in the Trump years where people have views. You think, I, I think you have that view because you like, you get excited by bullying. I think you have that view because um, you've always had cruelty inside you that you were afraid to express and you find it emancipating when somebody expresses it. Or I always thought you were, um, you know, the usual Washington type of, you know, not a hero exactly, but um, that, you know, you, we, there were things you wouldn't do for a dollar. And, and now I discover there's nothing you wouldn't do for a dollar. And so, so, so I don't think we have to say, you know, sit down with anybody. Why can't people yeah. just talk? Um, and there's certain parts of the Twitter sphere. And there's certain people who are actually right wing who present themselves as liberal who say, my view is, you know, you know, B- Bashar Assad sits down in the chair opposite me. I will debate him on his plans for genocide in Syria. I don't believe that. Um, uh, uh, you know, so I, I don't believe that. I, I don't think you have a duty to have conversations across all differences. Um, it's more, it's challenging to think what are the important differences at which you say, you know, I can't, I'm not going to, at some point, we're going to have a vote and, if, and one of us will win and one of us loses, one of us loses. And beyond that, the vote is symbolic of the possibility that at some point we have to have a fight over this and one of us wins and one loses. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, so those people on Twitter say there are, there are divisions um, and, and look, if someone says, and from their point of view, I'm on the other side of that line, I, I can't gainsay that. Um, that's how they see the world. If, if that is a conscientious point of view. My question to those people is, for me, the barrier is how much does cruelty form point of view, fundamental of your point of view? And I would say to them that through a lot of observation, a lot of experience, being on the so-called left does not insulate you from having cruelty as a foundational element of your personality and your politics. That is something that I've come come to agree with. And, and I, I, we, I'm going to talk a lot about your transformation. And um, as I say, I want to go through the arc of your life. And it, this we, it may take some time because I, it's fascinating. And I want to talk about some things to see if you still believe things that I think are, <laughs> are, are, are completely wrong. But we'll get there. But I do want to go back still to your another aspect of your uh, of your origin. I, I began one of my books with a quote from Louise Bogan that said, uh, "The initial um, uh, mystery, the most important initial mystery of any journey, is how did the traveler reach his starting point in the first place." It's a wonderful quote to me, and I want to I want to try and understand what I would say is your starting point, which for me at least is your it, 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 at least from the point of view of this conversation is when you joined the 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 Bush White House. Okay. We'll we'll take that. I mean obviously you've had many starting points. I, I was forty when I joined the Bush White yeah, House. Okay. Nearly forty. So I, I was uh, um, not a young person. And I was a very I was married. I had two children. Um, so if if I'm saying what is that is for me very much the middle part of a story. People need to be, I was quite an, an old person by uh, speechwriter standards when I went to work as a speechwriter. That's an important thing to note. I think it's very important. Um, were you one of the older people around, or uh, you're, well, I guess your Gerson, who your boss was, was older than you. Yeah, we, we were. We were. Um, look, the normal White House speechwriting shop. Uh, if you were to see the Reagan shop or the Clinton shop, what you'd see is um, one one person who was near in age to the president and was something like a long-term associate of the president. And then a lot of 20 year olds. Um, and, uh, and then, and uh, doing the work and writing and, and the speech writing shop tends to get, as administrations get older, the speech writing shop tends to get younger. The W Bush speech writing shop was more middle-aged uh, than, than usual. And most of us were late thirties, early forties. But um, but that was that's quite unusual. Okay, well, let's go back to your teens. The story I've read, and it, it may or may not be true, is that um, what what started your road to what the twentieth century conservatism uh, after having worked for the social socialist candidate was uh, the book by by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yeah. So maybe yeah. You can 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 you talk talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So. I, I learned one thing, one fantastic thing on that campaign, um, which is uh, I was knocking on doors and I, my job was to collect information, how many voters were at this address. That was my only, we were double checking, the, the province kept a record, but I, we wanted to have our own independent record, exactly how many voters, was anyone visiting, what, uh, was there any extra voter uh, that yeah. was maybe not registered who could add to the rolls to get them to, or to vote. Um, 
But I exceeded my remit and began asking people what they thought was the most important issue in the Ontario provincial election of 1975 or whatever year it was. And as I, I was a keener and I brought this information back and uh, my supervisor, who's some grizzled veteran of 24, 25, uh, just threw up my work and said, that's not how their minds will work. And he says, that's what I've never gotten. To ask a voter what is the most important issue is like asking him what is his favorite prime number. It's just, it's just <laughs> not the way his mind is organized. Uh, it's not the right thing to ask. You won't get useful information. Um, but my politics are very much a product of the, late, of the late 70s and early 80s. So I was a product of this Cold War consensus, um, which began to fall apart in the late 70s. And suddenly things were not working. And I have an analytic mind. I began to think, well, why not? Why? Um, I wrote a book about the 70s. Why do the prices keep going up? Um, why do why do the, the uh, why are all my friends' parents' marriages splitting up? Um, why uh, why do the Soviets seem on the rampage? And the Soviets, in particular, became and I I, I would say in retrospect, the, one of the reasons the Gulag Archipelago as a book hit me so hard um, was we were a Holocaust survivor family who never talked about it. And that the Soviet gulag became a, a place, something you, that was similar that you could talk about. And so uh, we read, my, my family, we read endless, we read the, um, you know, uh, uh, Evgenia Ginsburg, we read, and we read Jews who had been in the Soviet gulag system. Because that was that one little bit of remove where it was tolerable. You could hear it. And, um, a, because otherwise it was just it was just too much of a rip, um, and so uh, I came at this, and my I remember having many arguments with um, or discussions or sometimes arguments with my mother because I was absorbing this whole new or new to me literature of the late seventies about inflation, about um, reasserting American power, about winning the Cold War, and uh, she was uh, very much in the intellectual culture of a decade and a half earlier. Um, and that, but that was, that was what made me a conservative was, um, absorbing those answers to those pressing questions. And the thing that set me wandering later was, and the, th the thing where I see both myself as continuing as I still think those answers were basically right. Um, but I think one of the things I've learned from politics is political questions are always conditional and contingent and answers to them are always perf imperfect. Um, but if you find right answers to problems, that means the problems stop being important and politics can't be organized based on those problems anymore. And that the story, I, I, this became then a major theme of my writing about the conservative world after, after the Bush administration, was that you had a lot of people wanted to go back and solve inflation one more time. You had a bunch of people wanted to defeat the Soviet Union one more time, um, wanted to stop crime one more time. Well, those things had been done. So... Um, and while there are people, historians, who might be able to argue whether the conservatives have been right about them or not, that question was really only of historical value. You said something that made me wonder. It's interesting you're, you say this question about prime numbers, and I'm a big fan of prime numbers. I'm not going to ask about prime numbers. <laughs> yes. but, uh -oh. but, no, 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 no. no, no it's not going to be a quiz. It's not going to be a quiz. Why is it, you know, I... I contribute to campaigns, and I'll make clear, I mm -hmm. contribute to a campaign of, of, of Biden for president. I get every day, uh, I, never, I never respond because I know it's just a ruse to get more money and I'm just happy to give the money. But that, uh, asking me why, what I think are the most important issues. Why do candidates do that, do you think, when to their supporters? It's an endless stream of, you probably get the same things, but if you contribute, asking you what you think are the most important issues. I'm sure they don't care, but why do they think I... I it does does it, It's just to give the appearance that they may care about me? Is that the reason that they do uh, that? Yes, and to get a sense of engagement and ownership and caring about the campaign. Um, uh, they also, if you're getting a lot of that question, it means you probably answered it at some point along the way in the past. Um, and so that some algorithm has registered yeah. that that is the way to get your attention. Um, the Trump campaign sends out a steady stream of two kinds of messages, abusive and nice. You know, why haven't you contributed? And please contribute. And they are doing that because they're constantly testing. 
some people respond to one, some people respond to the other. And once you respond to them, then you get more and more of that thing you've responded to. It's interesting because I, I, some have put me on a Trump list, so I'm beginning to get the Trump ones too. But it's interesting to me, and maybe it's just a characteristic of the left versus right or Democrats versus Republicans. It's interesting. And maybe just Biden being kinder and gentler. Um, I never get the angry ones from the from the from the, I always get sort of pleading or requests mm-hmm. to say, "Oh, I know it's a hard time. We haven't heard from you." Uh, but I never get the thing. I never get the the, the hard ones. So yeah. Maybe that maybe they yeah. should try that too. Maybe it's an example of of some of the techniques that the left could learn. Um, one of the things that surprised me that I hadn't realized about you, um, which also made another connection, is that you after Yale you went to to Harvard Law School. Yeah, so you got a law degree. Why? What is intriguing to me is that you became a journalist, to some extent, yeah. a writer, but a journalist, ultimately. Uh, and uh, I mean, you, so I don't want to just classify you as that, but it's it, it's. But and your mother was, and you didn't mm-hmm. become a lawyer. So I wonder what were, did you always want to? Did you because of your mother were you always intrigued by journalism, or is it just happened? Did it just happen? Oh. Um. Well, the law school, it is actually a barber story, the law school story. So I, I, there were two years in between college and law school. I was back in Toronto and I, I was getting into a lot of mischief um, and uh, wasting time, wasting money, um, just, just getting into trouble. And, and, I mean, I'm not a big trouble person, but as, as much trouble as it was possible for me to get into, that's the amount of trouble I was getting into. And my parents were increasingly concerned about my um, aimlessness and um, uh and I, I was haunted, I think, my, in my own defense, I said what, what made it so aimless was I'd come out, I'd graduated from college, and I'd always had this idea that once I was at college, I would have the answers. Um, I would have read all the big books. I would know what there was to know. And I came out of it just crushed by the sense of, I don't know anything. Uh, I, uh, I just feel, uh, I feel stupider than I did when I went in, more ignorant than I did when I went in. And I wasted time when I was in college. And so, so I, I then made up this list of things I wanted to learn and to read about. And so I spent those, a lot of the time in those aimless two years, also just, you know, staying up till three in the morning, reading things. I, I went through like the, um, the first year economics program um, and read the, the, the economics textbooks. Um, I uh, went uh, I sort of snored my way through bar mitzvah classes. I went back and became serious about Hebrew. And, and then I was doing other things too that are less less creditable to talk about. So after after about a year and a half of this, my mother said, you need a plan. Um, and if you don't have a plan, I'm going to make a plan. And uh, then she said, my plan is that you should go to law school. I said, what? I don't want to go back to school and law school. I don't want to be a lawyer. I know I, we knew lots of lawyers. I didn't like the life. And, and she said, you'd be good at it. I said, I, I, at first... I don't even my mind. I, I think like an historian, or now I'm interested in economics. I want maybe something else. And she said, "Well, let's just try, just try writing the LSAT." So I bought one of those books and uh, those test books, and there's, there's, there are things that are like 20, 21, 22 questions. So the first, I did the first one, and I got three out of twenty-two right. And I showed it to my author. I said, "Look, this, you can, I, this my mind's just not organized this way. I'm just it's just not for me." Um, look, a three out of twenty-two. She said, "Let me, let me, let me try one." So she tore out one of the pages and, and she checked it. She got 22 out of 22. <laughs> Bam. Did I mention we're a very competitive family? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was clear. Wait a minute, 22, I, I, 16, yes, I get it. Then I, you know, it would humble me, but it wouldn't be, 20, you got 22? That's not, okay, it can't be as hard as it looks. <laughs> so I then became really good at writing the LSAT. But of course, I had trapped, it was psychology. I was trapped. I having proven that I could do so well on the LSAT practice test. Now, what excuse did I have for not doing the real thing? And once I did the real thing, what excuse did I have not to go? Um, And it was a weird experience. Um, I came, I have very ambivalent feelings about it. I met some wonderful people there, including a professor who had a huge influence on my life, Judah Schwar, who taught at the um, government department. Um, Also, um, Jewish refugee, landed in Montreal, and then ended up at Harvard. Um, And uh, uh, I never practiced law, but it has formed a lot of my thinking about the way institutions work ever since, and um, and and was a great gift. Did it affect your conservative outlook? I I I've tried to wonder what just for family reasons how my brother made that trajectory, and I noticed that as 
he went he he did a, his law degree in Canada and then and then did a master's in law at Yale. But um, uh, but I, he progressive progressively became more conservative during that time. Um, so I'm just wondering, did it did it affect your? Well, it affected mine, maybe in a different way from his. Um, the first at law school, um, the law schools in those days had a strong left wing tilt. I mean, it was, some of it was superficial because yeah. people did then go out to make a lot of money. But the the language of of the school, and so there became quite self conscious little nodes of conservative students. I, I was president of the Federalist Society at, at Harvard, and we sort of probably radicalized each other. We created an alternative. Um, ghettoized social and intellectual culture within a seemingly inhospitable environment. And over time, those things, they were very new when I was there, but they became very powerful and created promotion networks and, and all kinds of other networks. Um, for me, the way, the way law had an impact on my thinking was, uh, there's a famous sentence of Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great judge and Supreme Court justice, who said, the life of the law is not logic, it is experience. And um, that, through my life, I was that, that I'm always very interested in the question of how did we get to this point? And there are oftentimes solutions that are good solutions. I, one of the things that I, I will have this discussion with more liberal people, they say, the answer is to abolish the electoral college. We answered everything. But well, you can't do that. It's not, it can't be done. And, and if you were to do it, and, and, if you, and you would also unravel so many things in American life. So even if you could do it, you would have to think twice about it. But since you can't, you shouldn't even think about it because it's not a doable thing. And then there are these workarounds, these compacts. And said, but, you know, if you undo the electoral college, you're undoing the two-party system, which may be good, but you, you need to really think about what you're, you're doing. And so I just came away from that with a deep sense of um, institutionalism. Um, lawyers are, the, the, you are taught that Institutions have their own logic. Uh, you can't just make things, you just can't issue decrees um, and may expect things to happen. And that is something that for me was a lifelong lesson of, of the law. I've always wanted to think things through for myself. And that was one of my reactions, by the way, after the, the Bush administration, which is, you know, to jump ahead to that story, um, very effective. I mean, the 9 11 experience was just so shattering and personal. And we lost a dear friend uh, in the attack, um, my wife and I. And um, and it just, it, but it also then raised a lot of topic matters about which I knew very little. Um, I'd never much paid attention to the Middle East. Um, I had not been much interested in, you know, um, you know, I, I I'd been to Israel to see family. Uh, I you know never I never wrote about it. I never much thought about it as anything other than like you know. Um, Middle Eastern Florida. Uh, so Zionism wasn't a big part of your, you know. Well, well no, it's more. It's more like the. It, it was. It was the unquestioned, unquestioned Jewish Zionism of the seventies and eighties, which is, you know, back in those days, what happened is, um, you know, Shimon Peres would come to Toronto for the UJA fundraiser, and everybody would clap. And Menachem Begin would come to the UJA fundraiser, and everybody would clap. Um, and the idea that they were different, that was not, that it was so far away. It wasn't, you know, he was the prime minister of Israel, so you clap. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we had family there, and we spent time there, but I, we didn't involve ourselves in the internal concerns. Uh, and in that sense, we're just not that into internal Israeli. Pop my mother a little bit more, but, 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 um, so yeah, we were, we were Zionists, but we were for everybody. And, um, uh, you know, whoever they wanted to elect, we were for that. Are you um, still that way? Not, not so much so, but broadly, yes. I mean, I, 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 I do the tell the Prime Minister of Israel Israel. that um, ev every answer the Israelis face comes attended by enormous risks. Peace has risks, war has risks, concessions have risks, hard lines have risks. My children will not shoulder the rifle uh, to pay the cost of a risk gone wrong. So I'm not going to tell um, I mean, people there, so long as what I increasingly are, so long as you remain within a broadly democratic liberal culture. And there are things that are happening in Israel now that are very worrisome. Give me very worrisome. Um, uh, so that's a different thing. But like, you know, if Israelis democratically decide to give back the West Bank, that's 
fine with me. And if they decide to keep some of it that democratically, that's also fine with me. And uh, because I don't bear the risks that are caused with their menu of terrible options. But you take it as, it's funny, I'm glad to go in this direction, what the heck, but you take it as granted that that it should be up to them what happens to the West Bank. Well, as a matter of fact, it is. Oh, as a matter of, yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. But but um, it's an interesting question. I mean, so you say, you know, it's their decision and as if there's not. A- yeah, like, 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 I should say, I mean, it's not but how they approach this problem is their decision. Yeah, and, okay. And yes, and obviously when I think about it, I have identification with the Israelis and, you know, uh, I wish everybody well, but I don't have an identification with non-Israelis. So, you know, these are my relatives. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't, Anyway, but to go back to the 9-11 thing, so I, I, so I got swept up in this moment where the country was suddenly plunged into this whole, I, that this is not stuff I'd come to the Bush, I'd come to the Bush administration to work on trade issues mostly. I was very excited, I mean, I'm a free trader, and that was, I, I, my remit, the reason I was hired was um, to work on all the domestic economic issues, trade, ag, there was going to be a big agriculture bill up, and, and those things interest me a lot which is um, a foible but, or a peculiarity or <laughs> maybe just <laughs> an opportunity to bore people. But, uh, but they, so that's what I was there to work on. And, uh, and then we're, it was an administration about completely different stuff. And I was in many ways um, not in my zone of familiarity. Um, you know, I, I, and as of, in, in 2000, as of no, September 11, 2001, I don't think, I, I don't think I'd ever visited the Persian Gulf. I'd certainly never visited Iraq. Um, I, very, I knew history from a book. Um, I'd met a couple of uh, exiles. I'd read Kanan Makia. Um, you know, I was interested, but I was an amateur. Um, and then, then this thing happens, and, and all my friends from the Cold War, which is something I had been very invested in, I spent a lot of time on, and tra- I had traveled in um, uh, Central Europe, and I, I did know that world, and I had followed with very closely the developments of the 1990s, pulling out the um, transition from communism to um, to liberalism in Central Europe. All my friends who'd been on the right side of that issue all had some answers about what to do in the Middle East, so I listened to them. And one of the things I came out of the Bush administration doing, this goes back to the question about law school, saying, you know what, from now on, um, I'm not listening to anybody about it. If I'm, if I'm going to make any mistakes in the future, I'm going to make my own mistakes. Okay, look, um, what I want to do first, before I take you back again to the Bush years, because I'm not going to let you go free there yet, um, in my mind, is is I, I've tried to sort of think about your transition out of the person who wrote the books I know of before and during the book, Bush years. And to the person you are now, and and your views have changed in a number of ways, and it's amazing to read. And I, I'm fortunate because I happen to read those two books mm-hmm. side by side, so I can compare statements of the same man, uh, twenty years apart, more or less, or almost twenty years apart. So, what when I think of the source of your own change in view of of the success or lack thereof of conservatism um, in the '90s and beyond. There, there's a few quotes of yours that from from um, the new book. Um, one says, after 2008, the sorcerer's apprentices of the conservative world conjured up demons, intending to control them, but the demons proved too strong for them and knocked them aside, hurling open the door to the sorcerer himself, Donald Trump. Uh, I think I'll read all three, and, and so mm-hmm. and then we can comment on all of them. There's another t- point where you talk about having talked to a young Republican. And you say, he, he spoke in a tone that I probably had shared at his age, of stark choices between left and right, of certain and eternal doom if the wrong side prevailed in even one single time, and of startled surprise that I could not share his perceptions. I answered him only briefly then. I was there to listen and not talk. But here's a longer answer now. I found this a profound statement, by the way. That's, that's me talking about you. The possibilities of the future are, always, are, are shaped always by the decisions of the past. And 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 that's why I'm not going to let you go free for it with, Don, with 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 Bush because I think I think Donald Trump is a direct legacy of 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 George Bush. But let me read the last quote um which is that um which I think is one of the most honest statements of a change of mind that I've read in a book and and um and it's uh it's a 
it's a discussion about the gold, Cold War warriors, Pearl, and all the and the people who you were talking about in the Bush administration, I guess. An error of observation led to an error of advice that the most important constraint on the United States was not resistance by objective facts, but a lack of subjective willpower. The claim was all fantasy, and harmful fantasy too. I partook in it in, in some elements of this fantasy at the time, and I do not write these words to criticize others more than myself. All of these sec suggest to me that you look back at some level at, at, at the younger David Frum and, and are disappointed in some aspects of why you bought the conservative line. And, 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 and they present to me some, you know, period over 2008. I'd like to know, at, during the period from the time you left the Bush administration to the time you began, even before Trump, writing about Trump, mm -hmm. that change and how did it happen? And at least did you're, obviously we all have our own perspectives that may not be real about why we yeah. do things. But, but what's your perspective of why you did, did it? Yeah, well, as I said at the very, very beginning, some of these processes are not visible yeah. to ourselves. Sure, of course. Um, and some of them we may not be honest with ourselves about, not to be because we're dishonest, but because because yeah, we don't are, we we don't process them right. But if I were to tell that story, so um, it was evident by early two thousand four that the ideas on which the Iraq war was based um, were not true, uh, that there were no WMD in Iraq. I don't believe that George Bush ever lied about that, but I, I do think he um, people deceived themselves um, and uh, they, they chose the evidence they were going to believe. Sure. Uh, and, and self-deception is a much realer thing in politics than deception of others, because it's very hard actually to, to keep two lines of thought going this thing that i believe this other thing that i say they tend you know to that's uh, i can't interrupt i'm going to try not to drop it i tend to interrupt too much anyway but that's what amazes me about trump by the way is he's a, he can effectively unlike bush who I, i'm willing to agree he he and some of his call i i don't think the same is true for all of his colleagues but deceive themselves because they wanted a result and they and they took whatever we all do that we all want to believe we believe this and we'll find the evidence that takes us there that's one of the great right. things about science science teaches us how to how to question ourselves but but trump is really amazing because he can he he um knowingly lies and knows he he's knowingly lying it's really kind of an amazing yes. I, I haven't seen any i haven't seen anything comparable in a politician it is remarkable so so um, things began to go wrong, and I began to worry a lot about why they they'd gone wrong. Um, and and then I discovered that when we began to talk about this, it was a, a difficult um, thing. People did not. I mean, There's a joke that um, sort of circulated among some like-minded people at that time, which is how many Bush administration uh, officials does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is there is nothing wrong with that light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> and that was the you, you just you couldn't see it, and 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 then it was also evident to me. Um, I mean, I I thought one of the reasons I had been for the Iraq War is I thought the Afghanistan project was doomed from the start, and the, the thing that Obama always said is that, that by going into Iraq, uh, we took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan. That always struck to me as the best single best argument for the Iraq War was do not commit yourself to Afghanistan, which you cannot fix. Oh, um, it's funny because you write as if you thought that George Bush going into Afghanistan was a good thing. There's no choice about going in. So but, let me but, refine this. That we, what, what, there, about what happened in September, October and November and December of 2001, there was, there was absolutely no choice. You, you had to do that. I think the great turning point in Afghanistan was the moment that Osama bin Laden escaped in December of 2001. Um, and one of my, my might have been of history is what if bin Laden had been caught in December of 2001? Do I believe, I think the United States would have gotten the heck out of Afghanistan right away, or some token commitment, but would have said, you know what, business is over, let's get out of this. But having failed, governments often respond to failure by doubling and tripling and quadrupling their investment yeah. and, and, and then defining new, object, new objectives that are so impressive that no one will remember the failure of the previous much punier objective. Are you, we're not here just to catch some yeah. Yeah, we're malefactor. Here, we're bring freedom and justice to the world. Hmm. Right, and so so it expanded. And I thought one of the things is, um, well, look, if, if you're gonna try to um, re renew a society, 
and this is where, you know, Christopher and I uh, were so much in agreement and you probably were in disagreement. Iraq is in every way a more promising place to try this than Afghanistan. People can read for one thing. That, that's a big head start. Um, they, ha- they have bureaucracy. They have, um, uh, and that turned out to be an illusion. They, they didn't really have yeah, a bureaucracy. Yeah. It wasn't really a, fu- a, f- a functioning state. In fact, one of the things we got wrong was we thought Saddam Hussein was a much more successful ruler mm-hmm. and a much more modern ruler than he really, than he turned out to be. Um, but it certainly looked like a more modern place. Uh, and the other thing that I was, uh, another reason I welcomed the Iraq thing is there's another debate, which is maybe the, the country to focus on as um, a source of terrorism was Iran. And one of the things I've always believed is that any U.S.-Iran conflict was a mistake, that, that Iran is, um, this is a society, with a country with that, and I've partly, I'm here influenced by my many friendships in the Iranian diaspora, mm-hmm. that this is a country that is ready for a transition on it, under its own power. and. And our job is to be patient and to stand back and wait for that transition to happen. And it's a very propitious place for a transition. And if we intervene, we probably will empower the worst elements in Iranian society. If we intervene in almost any way, we will empower the worst elements, not the best. And the best elements there seem so strong, um, so exciting that you don't, you want to make sure make sure they all, always feel like they've got a friend around the corner when when they're ready for it. Anyway, so things so as things began to go wrong, and I began to try to talk about it, and you discovered it was not something you could talk about. And then, and then, meanwhile, in the area where I really did feel comfortable and I really knew the data, which was the American economy, it was evident in two thousand five, two thousand six, that the Bush expansion was not working for most people. And although I, I will not claim that I foresaw the financial crisis, what I did see was there was something really ominous about an economy, and I wrote about this in 2005, where incomes are not rising, but spending is. And the spending is rising because people are taking on more debt against their rising asset values. Uh, um, and uh, my, my late father, one of his rules about business is that income is a fact, but um, wealth is a theory. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? like. It, I got a corner store. It throws off, you know, hundred dollars a week in rent. That's a fact. What is that hundred dollars a week worth? That's yeah. a theory. In a different time, that's where the stock market goes up and down. Yeah, yeah. Um, people value that income stream at different t- prices. And so, what was happening was Americans who are not seeing their incomes rise were seeing the value of their houses rise. A theory, borrowing against it. Debt is a fa- debt is not a theory. Debt is a fact. Um, and and I so I got more and more worried about this, and and I began to think, you know, we need to. Rethink, and I be, and so I published a book in two thousand and seven that was um, like a, a halfway, a half baked cookie mm-hmm. of an intermediate phase where I said, "There's something is going wrong, um, and there are things we need to do." And that's where I began actually writing about the um, uh, global warming challenge. I began, I became interested in it because the carbon tax. I actually became interested the wrong way around. I started being attracted to the solution of a carbon tax as a way to raise revenue for the state. Yeah, do things uh, in a way that did no harm to anything important. Um, anyway, so that's where I was. Well, well I, you know, just uh, uh, you it, that still comes through in in the new book in a way that I disagree with you. I mean, you talk about the carbon tax, and we'll, I want to spend a lot of time on because you do spend a lot of time on climate change and carbon tax, and I'm very impressed because I think carbon ta- uh, carbon tax is is a very rational approach, but I don't think it's an approach to you, you tend to. Uh, Approach it as an economic benefit, as a tariff, effectively that may be a, a pleasant tariff instead of an unpleasant tariff. In fact, I think yeah. you should do car- carbon tax and uh, approach climate change not because it it's economically beneficial in the short term, but particularly because it costs money. Because in the long term, it's beneficial, and and yeah. and the and 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 uh, uh, treating it as a tax that doesn't hurt is not the point of a carbon tax, it seems to me. But anyway, so having said that, well, why don't you respond? And Because yeah, we never know. I'll never know if we get there at the rate we're going anyway. Well, I'd, um, my carbon solution, as as you know, um, yeah. is not just about, and you, you make this point very powerfully in your book, that even if we were to stop emitting today, um, we've signed up for a future that yeah. may not be consistent with human civilization. Um, and uh, so we need to do something about that. So my in the book, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, carbon sequestration and, and how you do it. It's something that's just glimmering as a possibility 
right now. Um, it's expensive, but it may become less so. But it's not it's not prohibitive, and uh, so and it may and and given that we have a defense budget that is so crazy, there's become a hundred billion dollars more a year is being spent by President Trump than President Obama. What's it buying? No one can say. Uh, and mostly, we're preparing for a naval war with China, which we are never going to fight. Uh, so, you know, that extra hundred billion—just think of this as an insurance policy. That's not the wisest way to spend a hundred billion extra dollars. That's not the budget. It's the yeah. increase in the budget. Um, if that could buy you a lot of carbon sequestration, well, not that much, but yeah, it could buy you some. I, I your attitude, by the way, about about the defense budget is also very refreshing. I remember when I was uh, when I was in Cambridge, I do my PhD. There was a book came out, The Price of Defense by Philip Morrison and a, bunch, a number of the standard people and 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 um, uh, arguing that, of course, defense spending costs and you have to think rationally rather than just arguing that we're a stronger nation by spending on it. But in fact, climate change as a threat is, is a mil, is a and the military understands this and understood it more quickly than many of the civilian aspects of even those administrations that appeared to ignore it. Um, the military already had study groups looking at climate change because they realized that climate change is a threat specifically because of the socio-political implications of between 100 uh, over over this century between 100 and 600 million climate refugees that that you know if you look at what happened in Syria when uh, uh, and uh, as as and its impact on the world that's small potatoes compared to compared to the threat of of um of of climate refugees, which is uh, which is one reason why we should think of it's not inappropriate to take defense money, bloated defense money that is useless, out of the defense budget. It's actually appropriate because climate change is a defensive issue. Yeah, do you agree? And, and I I, th I do, and I think one of this pandemic um, should drive home to everybody this truth, which is um, all you know for four years, President Trump spent. Um, an enormous amount of money preparing for a naval war from China with China, and we now have a th a really a threat from China that's had really shattering costs on people all over the world. And President Trump wants to have an argument about whether China is to blame. That's not an interesting question. The question is, okay, you spent all this money to defend the country against China. Why did you buy warships when that was not the threat? I think I had a. Uh, I had a colleague of mine, a Nobel Prize winning physicist when I was at Harvard, who who um, uh, I was talking about the government spending on different things. And he said, I think that they still are spending money on on mules from the Civil War. I, I, there is this there is this inertia in military spending mm -hmm. that often is unrelated to actual threats. It's just a, there's a, like any government institution and you and here you're much more expert than I am, I'm, I'm sure. But anytime there's a lot of money to be spent. There's a lot of effort to spend that money, right? Yeah. Well, and, and claimants uh, grow up around it. So, um, you know, you build tanks. Uh, that creates a ta tank factory. Uh, that creates shops and interest mm -hmm. groups around the tank factory. That creates a member of Congress who is beholden to all the various interests that depend on the tank mm -hmm. factory. And now you tell that place that uh, maybe tanks are no longer useful. Uh, and they say, okay, well, fine. We take. What are we going to build instead? So, well, actually, we're nothing. Nothing. We're, we're taking all this money away from you, and we're not going to build any kind of um, rolling cannon firing piece of hardware. Uh, what we're going to do instead is sequester carbon. Well, they're going to think that's worse than communism. Well, that's it, but that's if you say it that way. And and I have issue, We'll talk about sequestering carbon. But I think that the problem is if you say it that way, of course. But in fact, there's again. This takes me years back uh, when I was. Uh, opposing uh, the missile defense and um, the waste of that missile defense is. Um, it, it, you can say it creates jobs to spend money on military technology, but in fact, it creates fewer jobs, it, f certain set of high-tech jobs. But if you present se sequestering carbon as a major potential technology development program that may in the end employ many, many more people, then I don't think people are going to object so much. If you uh, say- No, we, no, 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 but now you're overlooking the thing. Um, we're saying is, we're going to member of Congress from the tank fact making district. We're going to put everybody in your uh, district out of work. But good news, we're going to create twice as many jobs 
in this district. No, of course. Well, no, you have to pretend you have away. to lie. He says, no, I'd no. rather have fewer jobs in my district than more jobs no, in somebody I, I've else's been through district. That. I was been through that with a with the with the superconducting super collider in the United States where I watched it die because because it, you know you, d different districts were complaining about what they were or weren't getting and you tried to make sure it was being built in 50 states so you could get get uh, appropriate number of senators to to support it no i think you have to say that in your district i mean it's like saying well it's it's what you probably have to say to people in coal mining districts that what we'll try and do is repurpose those it will create new technologies in your areas to try and 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 retrain people to do a different kind of thing that may be better for your Mm -hmm. productivity and co economic competitiveness in the 21st century and at the same time better for the world maybe maybe that sounds naive well, too no uh, that's, that's what we try to do uh, and then we have to reckon with something we talked about at the very beginning which is um the american congressional system of government makes it more difficult for the united states to do things like that yeah. than it is for comparably organized countries with different systems of government and um uh, now we with coal mining, because it is a private sector industry, in the end, the government couldn't cannot save coal. Yeah, it's not going to. It's going to die no matter what. Uh, it's going to die no matter what, and and uh, we've already seen that. And um, and coal mining as a profession or an occupation has died a lot lo longer before the coal mining industry did. And very few uh, people the, employed, by the way. That's the other thing that's so ridiculous. You get rid of all the coal mines, and you'd, it would be it would I be a blip in unemployment. I think I use this number in Trumpocalypse that if you total everyone in the coal industry, not just the miners, but the bookkeepers, marketing, you know, uh, lawyers, everyone employed by every coal mining company, you get fewer people than teach yoga for a living. No, not teach yoga, than are licensed to teach yoga for a living in the United States. Perfect. That's uh, not from the book that I know of, but maybe it was maybe it was Trumpocracy, but I but it's yeah. a great it's a great comparison. And and, and so that's what's interesting that that's become a, a big issue because of course, as you say, it doesn't make any it just it, the first day of the pen of of social isolation. Many more people went out of work than well, maybe in the first hour of social isolation, many yeah. more people went out of work than 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 if you closed all the coal mines. But um, okay, we're jumping around. But I, I do want to hit uh, because we may not get to it, a sequestration because I was actually where where I worked uh, at the university. I was involved in a program of carb trying to promote carbon capture, and um, I've now come around to thinking that at least direct capture from the atmosphere is sounds nice but it isn't economically particularly viable if you the numbers i think you're quoting if you so if we put the best you can a goal for carbon capture is something like a hundred dollars a ton that's not achievable now but a goal to spend a hundred dollars a ton of carbon we put 10 gigatons of carbon globally into the atmosphere every, every year so that's th just to just to counterbalance what we put in that's a trillion dollars a year and that doesn't change it. That doesn't take carbon out of the atmosphere. That's a trillion dollars just to keep it the same. Ten trillion, if you want to reduce it, it's not hundreds of millions. And so it will be a challenge. I see it as a a much bigger challenge than I, I agree with you that it is a laudable goal and perhaps the most laudable goal because it, it is the one thing we can do where the physical consequences are in some sense known. If you take carbon out of the atmosphere, you know what will happen as opposed to geoengineering, which mm -hmm. you allude to in the book as I'm well. I'm really worried about that. Yeah, but you know, let me also uh, pick a bone here with you about that because I, I was a little surprised. It looked to me almost like the Trump line. You claim that it's China. It's actually not. Now, there's tons of, in fact, as far as I know, the, uh, China is looking at geoengineering, but I have many, many colleagues in the United States that are. And so first of all, I don't think we can point a finger and say China is going to do this and it's going to it's going to have problems. I, I I think geoengineering has certain problems. If you put aerosols in the atmosphere, we don't exactly know what's going to happen. But the one thing that a good climate scientist friend of mine informed me about, which I think it hopefully will make you feel better, is while there's a danger of geoengineering, because unlike fighting carbon production uh, or at least reducing the global carbon footprint of the world, one country can unilaterally decide to do this. Any country could decide to do this without the consent of the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is going to suffer or benefit from the consequences. So that is a concern. But the good part is that unlike carbon, which survives in the atmosphere for about a thousand years, if you put aerosols in and, and bad things start to happen, there's a half-life of about a year or two. So 
It is a danger, I agree, but in the, in a global yeah. sense, it's not something. And and I've changed my mind on this because I used to, I actually did a radio program once about how opposed to geoengineering I was, but I, I think now that it's it's something that's worth considering, and it and it's as a test in a way that won't be catastrophic or that may may not yeah. be catastrophic. So I wanted to just throw that out to you. Um, but you put your finger on the the, the issue, and maybe this is just a, a reflects a different set of dis- intellectual disciplines that we are interested in and comfortable with. Sure. So I'm I'm way less. Uh, comfortable with the science of it than you are. Uh, but what I can see is once you say this is something that could be done unilaterally, that what I hear is, uh, thinking about this from an international relations and a governmental point of view, I hear conflict because different countries are going to have different threat perceptions, different risk tolerances. Sure. Um, and of course, when when the risk is analyzed, the risk will not fall randomly on the planet. And the example I give in Trumpocalypse is a study that the Indian government did that found that, the, that a plan that the Chinese were considering would have serious risks for Indian rainfall. And so this is something I see as, as treading us on a path to, to war. But what, one of the things that is a real background fact to all my thinking on, on these kinds of issues and something that has really changed over the past 20 years was I mentioned at the very start, I was a child of the, of the Cold War. And for all of its terrible risks, the Cold War was built on the foundation of, of American power. And then I achieved, I, I spent the center of my life in a time of, un, of when American power was more unquestioned than ever before, that any power has ever been in the history of the world from 1990 to 2010. Um, and Maybe the 50s would be. Even in the 50s, really it was a great power competitor. After the Second World War, the United States was probably the only country that wasn't decimated, maybe but, then. But in this case, you were living in a time of peace and prosperity and stability. I mean, the, the world of 1940, America power, power was great in 1946, but it also felt in 1946, American power was not adequate to the needs of the world. I mean, America was half the output of the planet. Yes, so that made you look very rich and strong, but it was a planet full of starving people. And could the United States ever feed them? Probably not. And then once you set people on their feet again, then that 50% rapidly fell at 50% of world output. But there was this period from 1990 to 2010, 2005, when the United States really was supreme. Um, and we are now moving into a world in which the United States and China will be peer nations. Um, the United States will have certain, for a long time to come, certain advantages over China. It's more innovative, its power is more deployable, it has better alliances, but um, it's not, they're not so different. And that's going to be a new thing for Americans to think about. And so I am haunted by the possibility of major power conflict uh, and want to pay a very heavy price in all kinds of ways to avoid it. And the risk of geoengineering projects is the risk of great power conflict. And this is also represents a distinction between us. I'm older than you. I'm, I'm, a, not, I'm, 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 I'm a child of the, of the 60s, the mid to late 60s, but the 60s. And, and therefore, my attitude is very different than a, than, than a a child of the Cold War, particularly. I was a child of the, you know, grew up in Vietnam during Vietnam, and um, and that certainly influenced my view of of American power, and 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 I won't deny that it's affected me ever since. But um, one more qu- note about climate change, which is interesting to me, that um, besides a carbon tax, which I think we both agree for maybe slightly different reasons, is a rational policy. You also say we have to go. To, we have to go to nuclear power. And mm-hmm. and that in, did interest me uh, because I, I don't, let me just say, as a physicist, I'm not afraid of nuclear power. I mean, nuclear power conjures up for people fear, you know, from Fukushima to, you know, you just, you know, Chernobyl, et cetera. And whereas, in fact, I'm less afraid. It's a lot easier to detect a small amount of radioactivity than it is the pollution due to due to coal. Most of the energy people that I know, and and I've looked at this myself, would agree there is a place for nuclear power. We shouldn't we shouldn't sort of pretend that nuclear power is all bad, and we shouldn't we shouldn't close existing functional nuclear power plants if they're not dangerous. That's a ridiculous thing to do. But I don't think we can put all our eggs in that basket for a number of reasons, no. primarily economic. Namely, it it takes twenty years to build a nuclear power plant, an incredible investment of money, and history seems to show us, as far as I can see, that it's just financially not a particularly useful way to go, specifically when there is another nuclear power factory that that it works very well. It's called the Sun. 
And, and the sun does produce on the earth about 100,000 times more power incident on the earth than humanity uses every day. And so I'm out of, I just think nuclear power, it's worth having it as a piece, but it's not a panacea. And certainly, I don't think it's even in the current world economically competitive with what's happening with solar power. Anyway, this notion of you're being a child of the Cold War and American power, throughout the book, uh, when you're talking about going beyond Trump, not throughout the book, but particularly where you're talking about going beyond to Trump, you talk about American leadership. The question is, first of all, is it practical? Because as you point out, we're basically on almost on par with China. And I would always say, with the, some of the things you said, we're more innovative and we can transform things more quickly and we and we have better alliances. Well, all of those things are changing rapidly and um, Trump is responsible mm -hmm. for destroying a number of them. It's not clear to me it's realistic to uh, imagine us having the kind of hegemony we had, even if, it, if, if we could, but I don't see why that's a good thing. And again, maybe it's because I'm a child of the Vietnam War. In particular, I had an experience when I taught at Yale. A friend of mine was a science advisor to Mitterrand. And he invited me to the Elysee Palace to meet with Mitterrand and advisors, which was a big deal for me. And I bought my first suit, I remember. And um, I went there and we were talking about the challenges. Uh, the climate change was one, but there was there was at that time it was it was uh, uh, yeah, I think it was genomics. And there were there were a whole bunch of global science. They wanted to talk about global science programs that France could be involved in. And I remember at one point it wasn't Mitterrand, but it was one of the advi advisors said, why do you always talk about leading? Why can't you just be a part of it? Why, why do, you, why can't you, why can't instead of you talk about inspiring the world, the United States inspiring the world, why can't the United States be inspired? Why, why do we have to have a position of leadership, and why is it presumed that we must have that? So I want to throw that out to you. It, it, so it's a collection. It's a collective ac action problem. Um, so if you your your town wants to build a new town hall. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what everyone who's ever done a project like that has found is uh, that when, when a corporation or a wealthy individual says, okay, I'm putting down 20% of the cost on condition that the rest of you come up with the other 80%. Okay. You, you get a lot more action than when somebody says, okay, let's all put in the same $50. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the 20%, in that that first down payment toward the town hall makes people believe, hey, you know, this is happening. It's not because the first contribution of fifty dollars that we're still we're as far away as ever. Um, so the United States has always been able to goad other people in act, into acting, and then to make it less fanciful that every time, I think without exception, uh, since the end of the, since the end of the Cold War, when the United States has said, okay, you know, you're right, M Mr. Mitterrand. And that's, this is the story of the Balkans Wars. We'll step back. The hour of Europe has come. I think it was James Baker who said that about the Balkan War. You guys run it. And they can't. They can't agree. And, and that's not because Americans are good and Europeans are bad. It's because um, no country in Europe is that big. The way they overcome that problem is with the European Union. And the European Union is not a state. Uh, and it can't act like a state. It can't make central decisions. So yes, theoretically, the European Union could be a, um, as powerful and rich as the United States. It, it's a bigger po population, mm -hmm. but it can't act that way. They cannot deploy troops. They cannot have one person say, okay, uh, I, president of the European Union, commit the European Union to the defense of Bosnia. That doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. And so nothing tends to happen. When, as, as we've seen, and we're seeing this in the pandemic, we are running a real world experiment because the United States has not led. Yeah. It's been utterly absent. Yeah. So there is nothing preventing the European Union and Japan and everybody else stepping up and saying, in the in the absence of American leadership, we'll do it ourselves. Except what you get is a, every, every country for itself, selfish, narrow nationalism. Yeah. And it's going to have a long term effect because not only is maybe it's good that you have lots of different people. Uh, hunting for a vaccine separately rather than one big research project because it's you get the advantage of competition and because vaccine research is not so, so expensive. 
Um, China yeah, it's probably from a scientific perspective, when you don't know what the right route is, it's better to try a lot of different ones and then right. see what works. So maybe that maybe that's good. But what is not going to be good is what is falling, where each country says we need to have our own face mask industry. Each country says yeah. we need to have our own uh, antibiotics industry. And uh, the United States can maybe do it, but when you, that's going, uh, maybe, and the European Union can maybe do it. It'll be less efficient than if we had true trade. But what happens to Japan? What happens to post-EU Britain? What happens to a country like Canada? What happens to Mexico uh, in this world in which uh, everyone is building national champions? We tried that. The way uh, you just need one, you, one leader to overcome the collective action problem and not to give everybody orders, not to be a hegemon, because the United States will not be that again. Uh, but, to, but to act like um, the impetus behind what has to be a coalition from now on if we're going to have any hope. Well, it certainly has to be a, a coalition, and I guess the question is: that is 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 the United can the United States be the impetus of a coalition in which it doesn't lead? I see no evidence in history of that being the case. Um, I guess, uh, and 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 you know, the one the one you the, I was looking in my notes here, and I but, but the only thing I've ever agreed with Trump on are quotes you use disparagingly about him saying the United States is, you know, and he used it for a different reason, but him saying the United States is not really that different than other countries. We're not exceptional. We're, we haven't been better actors. But this notion that the United States has acted to inspire the world for the benefit of the world in a way that's different than other countries and hasn't acted in its own self-interest is not something I see from history. And so I wanted whether you might comment on that, because I know it's probably something we disagree about. Yeah. Um, look, I think we we have we, when thinking about America's role in the world, you need to cycle from the child view, which is the United States is uniquely good mm -hmm. and uniquely generous, through the smart aleck adolescent view, which is what I think the Noam Chomsky view basically is, which is the, the illusions are stripped away and the clever adolescent sees the truth, which is. Every, you know, the United States, it's no different than Sumeria or, you know, Sparta or any of the other empires of history. They've all been out for themselves. They've all been raping and pillaging for what they can get. Let's not have any illusions here, mom. Um, and then uh, that wisdom comes from knowing what the smart adolescent knows and realizing that from with many asterisks, many hypocrisies, uh, many imperfections, many flaws, that the childish version of it is not true, but closer to the truth. Um, and that the world that was built, especially since 1945, is the best governance project in the history of the human race. What, um, what, and, and it spread. And people say, what about all the countries that didn't benefit from it? It spread. So from between 1945 and 1975, that project was a project of the United States plus certain selected Northern European democracies. And then in 1975, it spread to a whole range of countries. So it's Portugal and Spain and Greece joined the Democratic Club. And then it spread again at the end of the 1980s um, to the Pacific Rim, South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, Ch uh, Chile returns to the Democratic Club. And then then um, South Africa. Um, and then in, in the 1990s through Central and Eastern Europe. And um, more and more and more people participate, each in their own way, but in a world that is based on collective security, underwritten by disproportionate American commitment, based on free trade, uh, based on um, the ever uh, accelerating reduction in armed conflict, which has been such a striking feature of um, the post-1945 world. And now, now we're in recession. We're going the wrong way. Um, and maybe we're doomed to continue to go the wrong way. But it is the wrong way. And we were on, from 1945 to 2005, we were on the right way. Well, okay, look, I think um, we, were, we were on the way to where we're at right now. And um, and and I think you can see a lot of the signs of it as as early I think as the as certainly at least as early as the Bush administration, if not earlier, the the buildup well during Reagan, at a, which was a time when I was particularly concerned about the buildup of military spending. As you say, there's less armed conflict, but huge, but much bigger military spending. And I remember during Reagan's period with Star Wars and and missile defense, and particularly during 
Um, well, to jump back, uh, 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 to jump back for a second. Military spending I... is what is it in many ways what reduced the armed conflict because what, what the look the way we got this new structure of peace. Uh, the reason the, the 1945 war ends in a more peaceful settlement than the 1918 war is because at the end of the First World War, countries like Germany and France and others could say, well, yes, the Americans are stronger. But it's not impossible that we could be a great power too. Um, so let's focus on building up our own military power. Yeah. After 1945, whatever it's impossible. Well, you know, yeah, every but dollar fact, that Germany spends on armed forces is wasted because it cannot do it. Well, but actually, uh, and this was something I did get from Chomsky's class, which was an American foreign policy, focused on the post Second World War War world, argued by looking at statements from the Council of Foreign Relations and 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 memos that have come out. He would have argued that there was it was actually planned. The United States looked at what the what the post you know as the war as it was clear the, how the war was going to end. Looked at the post Second World War world and said, how can we engineer it so that other basically we other countries are impoverished and we we can do what we want. And well, maybe and, other and, countries are not were not impoverished. I mean, Britain and, they got rich. and, and what, what they all got rich. They were well, all richer in 1916. They became, were no, but that's okay because they got rich because well, um, but they got they, rich they, because they, they did. because they they could look. Look, the point is that if Germany gets rich by helping empower America, the American economy, that's a good thing, right? I mean, if, uh, multinational corporations and and uh, can grow around the world. The point is, the United States after the Second World War, you're absolutely right, was the only world power. And the yeah. question and is, it, it, it said to it said to the, after World War One, Germany and France said we're going to try to stay in the great power business. And after 1945, the message this is and this is one of the things I think Donald Trump you know he's always complaining they don't spend anything on you know G Germany doesn't have an army anymore yeah, Japan yeah. doesn't have a navy anymore yeah yeah. So that, yeah that was that's a feature not a bug what, what the deal to the United uh, the, the the problem that Germany had has had through its history as a country is it can't feed itself. Um, so since 1870, the Germans have wrestled with two answers to this question. And uh, one answer was, why don't we build a giant army, conquer a slave empire in Eastern Europe, and have them grow food for us? And, and the second answer was, uh, why don't we build um, cars as expensive as a village and sell them around the world and use them to buy pineapples and papayas? And people said, the first idea, maybe it's unethical, but it's practical. The second idea, that sounds crazy. Yeah. And after 1945, the United States said, okay, option one, off the table forever. You will never be able to do that. Uh, why don't you try option two, sell cars as expensive as a village and see what you can buy, whether you can buy enough food to feed yourself. And you walk around Munich, <laughs> you walk around Berlin, say, this really worked. It's, and it's, it's not a failing. The fact that Germany was... Yeah. told you'll never be a military power again. And France too, you know, you do your thing. We are doing security for everybody. And we're going to pay more than our fair share because we're going to get more than our fair share of the benefit. That's, yeah, what Chomsky's complaining about. This is the greatest achievement in the history of human government. Oh, okay, okay. But actually, but there, Chomsky would agree with you exactly. And he would have said, in fact, what he said, it wasn't a, 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 a petulant teenager, but a child. If you asked a child... Do you think the United States w behaves as a country as other great countries have behaved around the world? The child would say, yeah. The point is that foreign policy is done generally not out of altruism, but out of self-interest. And maybe a more peaceful world is, is out of self-interest, but or a world in which... So, so there's nothing wrong with saying that we benefit from a economically no. healthy Germany, but, but, but to argue that we're doing it for Germany yeah, is, is I think... Here's, okay, but here's, and here's one more thing. I, we, I know we've taken a lot of time, but this is maybe... It's okay. No, no, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm so, I'm so glad to be able to talk, say right-wing things on, on this program. Yeah. So, so how is the United States different from previous empires? And the answer is, when you are 25% of the world economy mm -hmm. and you pursue your self-interest, predation is not going to work. You're too big. The world's too small. Uh, you, uh, you, you know, it's just that, that the opportunity, and this is one of the things that we're seeing in the Trump era, that, yeah, the United States still has the power to twist the rules mm -hmm. and to screw over smaller countries. But what we're discovering is when you're 25% of the world economy or 22 and a half or whatever we are now on our way down, 
the, your benefit from rules where Denmark can sometimes win um, is so great that, and you, the benefits from, and because your economy is so big, the benefits from predation are so small that your self-interest puts you out of the predation business. Uh, and that, that America, because it's just because the, the unique thing is it's not that Americans, as I said, are better than other people. It's they, they occupy this special position where because of their geography, they've had this giant, through history, this giant security surplus, yeah. which they can then export. And because of the size and diversity of the American economy and because of the liberal nature of, uh, uh, of American institutions too, um, the United States, it can't really benefit from predation, as Donald Trump is proving. It does benefit from rules. And because it of its liberal institutions, it's got a bias in favor of those rules anyway, where they are more domestically acceptable than a policy of predation would be, which is not to say the United States has never done predatory things. Or, it's done um, a lot of them. Okay. I mean, so if it didn't benefit, why Chile? Why, why, why? Why did why though? But Chile's a Chile's a, 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 a good confirmation of my theory because the United States did do something predatory in Chile in 1970 or 71, and it was a a terrible mistake. Um, so 73, I guess, was the coup. Yeah, 73. Uh, sorry, uh, it was a terrible Doesn't mistake, happen. and the benefits were tiny. Uh, the costs. Uh, to American reputation and prestige and ability to get things done were enormous. And so in the end, the United States played a decisive role in toppling the Pinochet dictatorship in 1989. Um, and I think I would argue, and I think a lot of people argue, that was a terrible, to the extent that the United States, it wasn't the only, it didn't do it, but to the extent that it green lit the people who did do it, it did a very foolish thing. Because Okay, so let's let's jump to today. Because it interests me what you said about, I agree with you about Iran. So we're, in one way or another, doing that to Iran now. We're, 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 we're effectively working very hard to destroy the infrastructure of that society instead of encouraging that society to grow from within. We're hurting yeah. the people of Iran. We're not, uh, we've, we've canceled treaties that looked like, in my opinion, they were in everyone's best interest, especially the, 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 the nuclear treaty. Um, and so we're doing that now. Now, yeah, it's, it's not it's not smart. Okay, uh, but interesting me. But you just. But this is why I, I I don't want. I didn't mean to. Well, it may sound like I'm catching you in something. I don't mean to do it this way. But you, you point out that Iran, you have viewed a, a, as Iran as a country with potential to 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 fix its own problems. So in in that case, and 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 therefore condemning it. Is not is not helping, okay? Okay. But so 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 hold on. You know where I'm heading. So yeah. So let's talk talk about the axis of evil. Yeah. Was that a okay, good let's thing? Talk about the axis. Let's you know, Iran is an axis of evil. Is that a good thing? A good way to 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 initiate the process by which which you say is we should be aiming for? Okay. Let me answer first the question about what to do now, and then go back to the axis of evil speech. Um, so first, we rightly impose sufficient sanctions on Iran to uh, inhibit their ability to do mischief because whatever the potential of the civil society, the, the Iranian state is a malignant actor um, and seeking nuclear weapons, seeking to export terrorism, it's responsible for this, uh, uh, the, the terrible, more responsible than any other single country, even Russia for the terrible atrocities in Syria. So we need to uh, put enough sanctions on them to curb that behavior. The Trump administration then tore up uh, the Iran nuclear treaty I didn't love that treaty, but my objection to the treaty was the problem was that Iran got all its benefits up front and paid out the benefits over a long period of years. So the problem is when you say, okay, we got this deal, and the thing that's wrong with don't, this don't, deal is they get all the benefits. I can't help interrupting. Do you not think we the benefit of having a non-nuclear Iran is, is a benefit that we get up front? Because no, that's, because I mean, we, Ernie Moniz is, is a colleague friend of mine. Because, and, because the, the benefit was they got a big chunk of money yeah. Right away. Mm -hmm. And it, immediate admission, readmission to the world trading system. What we got was a promise of a, a decade and a half of supervision of their nuclear program. So what we got was 50, 15 one-year benefits. Mm -hmm. And they got one big 15-year benefit right up front. Uh, the problem with that, so that's a, so you can see what's wrong with that. The, the problem with canceling it is they got their benefit up front. <laughs> and that the thing that was wrong with the treaty is the reason why you don't cancel it. And we lost by canceling it. We got our benefit, which was parceled out in increments over 15 years. I, I understand that, but it, it's sort of, 
I'm not sure it's 100% fair to say that. We, so we got, they got the benefit. Uh, and, 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 and the only thing we don't get, you know, we lose out on the fact that now there's every, every incentive for them to, to build nuclear weapons when they no, weren't, when that. they clearly what, weren't. What, what I said and, is, what I said is, we are told that over the period of 15 years from the signing of the treaty, that Iran will comply with certain procedures that make it more difficult for them to acquire a nuclear weapon. Yeah. So that is a benefit that is distributed over a 15 year period. Yeah. Whereas they get it. I understand they get it right away. Okay. But, 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 but it's so, more so, than, so, my sense of, is, so you, once you're in that deal, it's very foolish to cancel it because you also, can't get back. But, but, but it's what, not the a, Trump it's, people did. The Trump let me just say, did, I, 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 I want to get back to this because it's not, I don't think it's, it's, a negative that they benefited. Uh, the the many of the sanctions on Iran, like the sanctions we've done in numerous countries, what they do is really hurt the people in those countries. It really hurts the infrastructure. The, the where the people that bear the brunt of those incredible economic sanctions are are the people you're you're hoping who are going to in the end pull that country out of its current current trajectory. And I have a real the problem with that. Are- these, the sanctions are also felt by the military establishment. Of course, they are, but but and but, it's the only tool we have. But you want to be careful about them. And what has happened in the Trump years is that when they after they canceled the treaty, their solution to the problem of Iran got its economic benefits all up front was then to put in place sanctions that are more draconian than ever. That go beyond what is necessary to um, cramp Iran's military capacity and nuclear capacity, where they're trying to drive the country to revolution. And revolutions very seldom. End well, maybe never. And, well, uh, so we, in, in, in Iraq, process. it didn't. It didn't end well. We tried to create right. our own revolution. Well, that was the, uh, that, but that was uh, Iraq, Iraq was at least an invasion where you you know <laughs> there's the possibility of imposing an orderly state. Yeah. Um, in Iran, what's going to happen? The, the, the Trump policy is drive them to an to a revolution, and and power will be in the streets, and we see who gets it. Um, and there won't be any American soldiers there. To back go back to the acts of evil. Um, uh, that speech was delivered early in 2002. And it's a very different world and one where a lot of things you think that we all know. In, 19, in 2002, the activity of um, A.Q. Khan, who was like the Johnny Appleseed of the Pakistani nuclear program, that was a cl- highly classified secret. He, he was unknown to most people. In 2002, it was a, considered a clever thing to say that it was impossible that Iran could be aiding Hamas because Hamas was uh, Sunni and Iran was Shiite. Everyone Smart people just said that could not be true. And 2002 was considered a smart thing to say that Iran and nuclear and North Korea could not be swapping missile technology for nuclear technology because Iran was Shia and uh, North Korea was Stalinist. And it was considered a smart thing to say. Uh, there are a bunch of things that were smart things to say, um, except they were all untrue and it, they were known to be untrue. So what President Bush was trying to do was to say there is this nexus of states that don't have a lot in common with each other but that are engaged in sharing information, sharing technology, supporting each their own terrorist groups. Uh, the terrorist groups also have important autonomy, that Iran, Hamas got help from Iran, but it wasn't an instrument of Iran in the way that Hezbollah was an instrument of Iran. And that uh, as he's taking um, terrorism to the top of the list of American priorities, we need to think about how terrorism works. And he faced another problem, and this is where... Um, a lot of the rhetoric of the Bush administration came from, which is the word terrorist is a challenging word to translate into Arabic. Uh, because one of the things you're always worried about is that someone is going to translate terrorist into mujahideen, which is a word that at least in those days, I think it may be different now, it may be corrupted, but those days had quite positive connotations. Mm-hmm. So I don't speak Arabic, but there was a word that the administration wanted people to use, which meant effectively lawless fighter. And Arabic is a much more flowery, poetic language than English. Um, so a lot of things that sound normal in Arabic sound excessive in English. And a lot of things that sound natural in English sound very blunt and, and dry in Arabic. Um, and so President Bush was looking for language that would convey moral condemnation to prevent the translation of terrorists into mujahideen. Um, and so the language of evil and evildoer, which was people always thought was driven by his evangelical constituents in the, in the United States, no, they hated terrorists. They didn't need to be told the terrorists were evil. They already hated them. What he needed to do was to shape the debate in the Arab-speaking world, Arabic-speaking world, so that people did not use mujahideen to describe the terrorists. Um, and so, and what he was trying to describe was how do you talk about in the, these interconnections and interpenetrations of, of terror groups and terror-sponsoring states in a way that 
um, captures people's attention. Now, the big criticism of the axis of evil phrase, um, and I think this is probably a fair, is not that it was untruthful or inaccurate, and not there's this stupid argument that is made by that somehow that Iran was nice and became not nice because of the axis. No, of evil. I think there's another argument, but we're... but the real problem was it it may it cut off the administration's own retreat, and that the question it was too attention grabbing, and that it goes to this question of maybe after 9-11, we needed to find a way to deal with terrorism and then refocus. And having used this language, that became hard. We are now stuck with eight years of war on terror when maybe we should have compressed it into a shorter period of time and had smaller goals. Well, yeah, but may, what about the, I mean, the thing that's just the elephant in the room, it seems to me, uh, uh, that is that it was also, I'm not so worried about the, I mean, the Iran and, and North Korea ended up not being, but it was including Iraq in there. It seemed to me what was it, what it was was an invitation to create a reality in which an eventual invasion that people wanted to do and wanted to create a rationale for was automatically there by including Iraq in the axis of evil. Then it wasn't a big step to eventually erase Iraq because it clearly, once you create the reality where Iraq is on par with Iran or, or North Korea, then of course... If it's a country one can invade, why not evade it? So it seemed to me that the, one of the big problems with that was it created the, the groundwork for uh, it, what what certainly was, a, in a global sense, uh, in my country, opinion, uh, a moral and illegal invasion. Um, in this, in, um, and, I, and I think I'm now going to forget whether it was February or March of 2002. In February or March of 2002, I don't believe that George Bush had made the decision to invade Iraq which of course happened a year later. I think he was on the path to it, but the decision had not been made. Um, and- uh, I, I'm by that. The, uh, the acts of evil speech actually pointed him in the opposite direction. Um, and there, there was a choice to be made, which is if, you wanna, if what you wanna do is invade Iraq, then you wanna make your problem as small and focused as possible. You don't wanna waste time on Somalia. You don't wanna waste time in um, dealing with the Muslim armies in the Philippines. So um, the axis of evil speech pointed Bush toward a truly global war on terror, um, which had its own problems and may also have been a mistake. But uh, it was it reflected a moment when the United States was going to be working in many different places with a lower level of commitment in each place. Uh, and the, the, so the, if, the, if you're, what you want to do is invade Iraq, it's crazy to talk about an axis of evil. What you should do is give a speech about Iraq. And the unique well, you have to insert it if it's not part of already the 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 the, the global but, dialogue. But 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 the, the the thing about it is, if if the axis of evil were, is true, if it's a useful construct, then the obvious question when somebody proposes, and I'm not saying this like on one side or the other yeah, sure. about my own role, but as I, I was not a principal. Um, but if I'd been sitting around the table in the fall of 2002, when the, as we hurtled toward, or I would say, Mr. President you yourself in front of the Congress spoke of a global axis of evil. Um, you yourself talked about the e interconnected dangers in Somalia and North Korea and Iran. You are committing us now overwhelmingly to one tiny little project that may turn out to be so expensive that it prevents you from dealing with the axis of evil. And if you want to deal with the axis of evil, you have to you know, retain your freedom of maneuver uh, and bogging down in Iraq. And indeed, that is what happened. That by bogging down in Iraq, we were less able to focus on Pakistan and other places. And we never, um, I mean, well, I guess uh, coming back to my, it, this is an interesting political discussion I've had been planned to have, but coming back to my original argument against Afghanistan, originally was I had no problem with going into the people who actually committed the acts of terror, but deciding you're going to use that as an excuse to topple a government is a two different things. It's it's like, it's like you got to ask uh, the question, okay, so let's say some American bad actors do something in another country. Does that, uh, well, does that motivate the, 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 and, and maybe they're, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe they're harbored in some way by some aspect of no, uh, some, it, I know, I, I know it was much more ingrained in Afghanistan, but, yeah. but the point is, with the with the war on terror, what we what we end up doing was not. I mean, if you believe that there was a grander war on terror, it would be nice if the first thing you did was get the terrorists, and then maybe you well, could we say, tried, okay, and well, we and well, yeah, but, and and but, that. But over, but but, but the, the, Tal the Taliban and Al Qaeda can't be usefully. I mean, uh, they were they were so interpenetrated, and and. Um, 
Well, I think I think, but, but for the reason that you said that Iran, in some sense, that Afghanistan wasn't savable in the sense we, that I guess you would argue we, yeah, that Iraq we overcommitted was. To it. Yeah, um, we overcommitted but, you know, to it. I, well, I think what would have been, uh, well, this was, you know, what I suggested, Tom. I mean, if you want to have an effect. The effect, rather than a military effect, would be to you know bomb the madrasas with books, and educators, oh. and send teachers in because that's I mean you you've got a culture and you you talked there's a beautiful quote in your book about about conservatives versus liberals on, on culture versus politics which changes which, and at some level, if you want to change hearts and minds, I'm an I'm an educator so I guess I kind of feel education is a key factor. Rather than well, uh, the rather changing than the long. changing hearts and minds may be too big a project and not worth it and not expense and too expensive. But the United States had to it just it could it was not possible, credible, tenable in any way, and not right not to try to kill Bin Laden. And um, if you're going to kill Bin Laden, you have to kill the people who are protecting him. Yeah, I guess before I, I what I want to end this with, and I, I hope you don't mind if we go maybe another half hour. Is that okay? With you? No, is anyone going to listen to the to two and a half hours of us talking? Is that uh, uh, they will be they'll be mesmerized? I guarantee you. Uh, I don't know. I I I feel like we're now down. I've the done. A, I've done a, digits. I don't know whether people want to listen, but I want to listen, and I'm doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the uh, a central thesis that I that I think is important for to at least address. There's several times in in in. In the actually in the right man book, not in the Trumpopolis book, um, where you basically say if if it hadn't been for the act, you know, if if the votes had gone, if the Supreme Court hadn't done what they did, and if it hadn't been for the accident of that election, then this. And at the time, the argument I got from you was, well, it would have been worse. But it seems to me, if the votes had actually been allowed to be counted, and if, if there's no doubt. That Al Gore won in Florida. I, statistically, you can. I, I wrote a piece in the New York Times at that time. Forget the counting ballots. Just by looking at correlations between between votes in the in the one district with the butterfly ballots, Buchanan versus um, other issues, you could show that maybe five thousand of those people voted wrong. But it's not, forget that. If 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 Gore had won, what we wouldn't have, and the, the, we wouldn't have, in my opinion, the legacy that has led us. To Trump, we wouldn't have had the Iraq War, which turned a huge amount of the world against us at a time when we were, when we were at least had a great opportunity for goodwill among um, among the rest of the world. We wouldn't have had the incredible budget deficits, ultimately, which at the time you praised. I mean, you know, there's no doubt Clinton had a budget surplus, and at the time you say it was great that we gave it back to the people, but it led to an an era of ever increasing. Uh, budget deficits, which are net, which are now dwarfed by what we have now. So I don't think we would have the Iraq War, the trillion dollars in the Iraq War, wouldn't have put that kind of budget deficit impetus on on the country, and we would have um, not had the beginnings of an administration that procedurally, regularly deceived and censored science and 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 reason, including the claim that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, when in fact. Everyone at the time that I, that 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 I knew who was technical and when involved in, in assessing Iraq didn't think they were. And they might have been wrong, but but there was no. But anyway, so that was the first begin the first aspect of deception, and we'll go into some more. Um, and then the final aspect was the the fact that we would have had a climate tax because Gore would have probably put one in. Those are the four things that I think in the modern world would have made the modern world so different if we hadn't had the Iraq War, those huge deficits created the beginnings of of a government which regularly censored information in a way to make to make its own goals uh, um, uh, seem better for the public and and failed to address climate change so the world would be immeasurably better off yeah. if George Bush hadn't been elected so I want to throw that well, out I, well I, th I think it's it's probably it's, it's certainly true that Al Gore would have fried yeah, I'm not saying what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, it's not clear. And, and one of the might have beens, um, and I talk about this in Trumpocalypse. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I talked about it in The Right Man because the people, I don't remember now, but the people were still serving in the administration and I would have embarrassed them. Uh, but there was this little nodule of climate people are in, inside the Bush administration. Um, and uh, they had. Uh, on, during the campaign, which I had not been a part of, they had gotten Bush to commit to regulating uh, carbon dioxide as a pollutant, 
And there was a big push in the early months, and I was a part of this, that they quickly recruited me as a uh, fellow traveler um, inside the speech writing department. Yeah, that, right, in that the Central Apocalypse. We, we tried to get President Bush to recommit. Now, we, it was a, obviously, we were crushed. I mean, it was, it was, us, it was uh, us against Cheney, so we were crushed. But it, so that's not a real might have been. But here are the things that would not have been different. So we might have had some climate action um, in 2002. Probably we would not have had the Iraq war. Not 100% certain about that because there are people around um, Al Gore who felt about Iraq the way the people around Bush felt about Iraq, but probably not. Um, but we would have had the global financial crisis because uh, nobody would have gotten in the way of the subprime market um, and uh, the important legislative actions that sort of were the last moment happened in the late 1990s under, under Bill Clinton. Sure. And, and everything that made the, it was just part of the American consensus. I mean, there was that every respectable person was in favor of the securitization of mortgages, Democrat and Republican. Um, and they were all wrong together, but uh, that, that was just, it was such a consensus view. And stepping into the mortgage market is to spoil the party would have been something that very few administrations would have wanted to do, um, especially an administration which would have been in its sixth year, Al Gore would, you know, there'd be a huge Republican majority in Congress in 2006. So we would have had a global financial crisis. And then you have to say, okay, if you have the global financial crisis, but no Iraq, um, how different is the politics of the world really? And what well, you also don't stop in, in, in this situation is you don't stop the advent of the Euro currency, which is um, a, a, an event as consequential for the 21st century as the Iraq war, uh, because it is the Euro currency that um, impoverishes Southern Europe. But the, what the Euro currency did in effect was to subsidize Germany to export and subsidize or incentivize Germany to ex export and incentivize Spain, Italy, and the other less productive countries of Southern Europe to borrow. Um, and then when, the Europe, when, when that project collapsed, you got um, the economic preconditions that supported the radicalization of European politics after 2010. So I, I think you would have had um, less pressure towards xenophobic populism. One other thing that would have been um, that would have been the same is had Gore somehow won, uh, you might have had um, an even more permissive immigration regime into the United States in the tw in the two thousands than you had under George Bush. And immigration is also huge. So you would have had you wouldn't have had the Iraq War pressing us towards xenophobic authoritarian populism, but you would still have had the global financial crisis. You still would have had mass migration. You still would have had the Euro crisis and the effect in Europe. In Europe. How so? Maybe it would have been different. Maybe not. But I I don't think you're stepping into the looking glass into the into a different world from the you know. The, the well, man, course, it's I mean, not a man of the high castle in their, in their world. Everything is different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in no, their world, I mean, much is the same. And, uh, I mean, hindsight and is many point. other things we cannot even begin to imagine, uh, would have, would have been different. Who knows? It would have been the third term, third term of a say of a, Demo of a democratic president. So there might've been scandals that, you know, oh, sure. I mean, there could have been this. I mean, look, when I say uh, you, I had Al Gore been president, I mean, it, in, you know, in some ways it's like saying, what if Barack Obama had become president? Well, when I was actually on his advisor, it's one of his science advisory committees in 2008 before he became president. And I could have said, well, all these things will happen. And they didn't happen because he had to deal with a Congress that didn't allow these things to happen. And it was politics. So there's no doubt if Gore was elected, then, then one can't presume what would have happened, except that climate would have been obviously a big issue. And I, I don't... And, the, and you're right, the global financial crisis of the, uh, 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 of the 90s, I suspect would have happened. The... But the initiation of a of a trillion dollar war, which was the beginning of a of a regular series of endemic budget deficits, which have continued in this country, wouldn't have happened. The world might not have, if we hadn't had the Iraq War. I think I happen. Well, you know, it's again, it, it's all imaginary. Maybe we would just have, maybe we would have just had a bigger war in Afghanistan. And they, that, they, and, never know. Okay. That, with, and the anyway, same, if, with almost as many people dead and almost as but, much money spent, because remember that the one of the things that happened, and this was an objection, but by going to Iraq, Bush reduced the war in Afghanistan. So maybe Al Gore would have just spent that money on a different war. You're, you're right, and and you're right, and and I suppose we probably would have, could have, and should have. So so let's move to something. But there's one thing that really was initiated during the Trump during the Bush administration that concerns me most, because one of the things, of course, that concerns me a tremendous amount about the Trump administration is this is this 1984 
mentality of, of denying reality and denying reality over and over and over again enough so that until people believe that that reality is different. And, and that comes to my own purview in some sense in terms of science. It began, and, and I was part of a group that complained about this during the Bush administration. Let me read you some quotes. This is from Bush's father. Okay, Science, like any field of endeavor, relies on freedom of inquiry, and one of the hallmarks of that freedom is objectivity. Now more than ever, on issues ranging from climate change to AIDS research to genetic engineering to food additives, government relies on the impartial perspective of science for guidance, which is one of the most beautiful statements about the relationship between science and policy that I've ever heard. This is a statement from George Bush's administration, Scott McClellan, who said, this administration looks at the facts and reviews the best available science based on what's right for the American people. Okay, you sense the difference? We decide what's right, and we pick the science that we think is right for the people. Now, that's one aspect of, of the minute you start to pick and choose in science, or in Iraq, or anywhere else, to go for a goal that you, that you want to get to, that's where science comes in. Yeah. Because it okay. tells you that you should try and prove yourself wrong as much as you prove right. Let me read one more quote, and then we can have a yeah. little discussion. The other quote, of course, is the famous quote that came from... Uh, I, it was, I think it was given to a Washington Post reporter, but this is that one where he says, the aide said that the guys like me were in, quote, what we call the reality-based community. You know this famous quote, which he defined as people who, quote, believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore, he continued. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left just to study what we do. Now, does that sound familiar in the current I, I world? I certainly know that, know that quote. I have often wondered about whether it was spoken as powerfully as it was written. Um, there is a kind of, uh, yeah. uh, because it wasn't in the Washington Post. I, I'm now going to forget where it appeared, but, but it was in a book. It was, um, I just, I, I've always wondered about that quote. I'm sure it, it is connected to something that somebody said. I don't know, but it's also got a kind of uh, Mephistophelian grandeur about it that it just, it's just too good. It's just too good. People don't speak that way. Yeah, no, it's, uh, a, it's but, a great quote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, let, let's talk about this. So, so um, what the, spe the the words of George H. W. Bush are very formal. They're given a, in a in a speech. And Scott McClellan uh, is speaking off the cuff and uh, in an, in a improvised situation, and so he's being less specific. But here's what I was I, I was saying. this is I think one of the things about science generally, and I think you would agree. Well, I don't know if you'd agree with it. Maybe you wouldn't. In the end, scientists can only provide advice. They oh. cannot provide answers. Yeah, and we're we're living through this now. Um, with uh, coronavirus is a good example of this. Um, we are not going to wait until it is completely safe mm -hmm. before people return to factories, schools, offices. We are going to do that sometime before it is completely safe. What is the appropriate moment to do that? So the scientists can tell you the trade offs and the costs, but in the end, nobody elected them, and in the end, there's no answer. There's no correct answer. There is just it's a value judgment. And that's what, that's what politicians are for. And one of the things I have learned over my career is tremendous respect for the work of politicians. Um, what they, they, because they are experts. Oh, you're a friend of Norman, Norman Chomsky's. Like, his phrase, which he means as criticism, I think is praise, manufacturing consent. Mm -hmm. That's what po that politicians do because consent is not, does not exist in nature. Um, democratic consent doesn't because people, you can't really aggregate opinions. Um, in a meaningful way. So they, they create consent where it, to make action possible. Um, and so at some point on those two curves, they're going to find a point. What you ask from the politicians is that they be respectful of truth yes. and they be non-malignant, non-pathological actors who are trying to do the best up to the limit of their ability to do the best. Um, and, and this is where Trump is, is different. I mean, what the story about it, about the Bush administration, you say, well, why didn't they, you know, they're looking, the, they should have listened to more expertise on Iraq. They dismissed people. They were hasty. Um, they were biased. They, or they knew they started with the answer. Um, but they were, they were not malevolent people. And they were not people who, um, that, that statement of creating their own reality, that would, would, who, if it was said, whoever said it, didn't mean we will say 
that it's the best economy ever when 40 million people are out of work. What they meant was that we can do things that will actually change the facts. We're going to move so fast. Uh, we're going to do, be so successful that your assessments of our actions will already be out of date by the time you write them down because we will have done other even more amazing things we will be, uh, than we previously did. And that, that's the kind of statement that Silicon Valley executives make all the time. Well, but I'm, I guess I'm, I, I agree with you completely that both quantitatively and qualitatively, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to paint Bush and Trump with the same brush. What I'm concerned about is the seeds of what we're dealing with now. What you said before, in some sense, in that in that quote I I, I gave earlier in the in the podcast, where where basically we 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 reap what we sow, and and um. And, and 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 it's those seeds that I'm worried about. You, I will say that you. Okay, captured I, I, something. I, need, I need to stop because I want to say okay. this, this. This is a, something that is important to me, and this may be a good place to begin to wrap up. Sure. I think there are two. Th when studying the Trump presidency, there are two things that you need to keep in mind, and people, especially on the left, want to keep in mind only one. Mm -hmm. Trump. You have to study Trump both in the flow of history. Mm -hmm. um, where he came from in the American past. Yes. And I don't want to say that that's important. Um, and you also have to sub in the flow of geography mm -hmm. because similar things are happening all over the democratic world. Yes. In places where George Bush was never president, uh, in places where there was no George Wallace, in places where there was no slavery. So those things that are distinctive to America cannot explain Trump when you have Trumps in Hungary and Poland and Mexico and Brazil. So you have to explain them both historically, and both across time and across space. Uh, and one of the things I've tried to do in my two books now on the Trump presidency is say he's not a unique, he's not, he is a distinctively American event, but he is not a uniquely American event. And if we're going to study him, we have to study his counterparts in other developed countries. And, and my bias, I, I think, is to say that I am more impressed by the causes that explain why this is happening everywhere than I am impressed by the causes that explain why this is happening here. Okay, okay, but the, the you you hit the role. I mean, one of the reasons it's worthwhile talking about this is I'm a scientist and 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 you're uh, 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 have been both an advisor and a government and, and a journalist. No, no, but uh, you know, it's no nice way to say things. it. Let's just say <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 but but you but you're an expert. But you've been part of the political process in a way that I never have, and so it's important to respect that. And and um. And you hit on something that my wife was uh, worked for the government of Australia, and, and she was uh, uh, basically working, interfacing between scientists and government. And she made it quite clear to me that, yeah, you know, first of all, one thing that was always clear to me is that scientists shouldn't make the decisions. They're not elected to make the decisions. They're, they should provide advice. But at the same time, you've got two different communities that it's worthwhile realizing that what's of interest to the politicians may be very, something very different than if it, it seems important to the scientists. That doesn't make it wrong that the different thing is of interest to the politicians. It doesn't make it wrong that the politicians may be more concerned about the economy than, than how many people are dying. It's it just a different, it's a, it, you just have to recognize that they're coming from different places and they have to answer to different constituencies. And the best thing you can try and do if you're teaching a scientist out of an impact is to try and appreciate what's important to the politicians and similarly have the politicians realize what, what's what's important to the scientists so so there th there's nothing wrong with them having different priorities and ultimately it's the politicians who have to make the decisions and in a democracy they're elected to make the decisions and they should be making the decisions but your point is exactly right what scientists should provide is advice and what the government should do is take that advice and the seeds of and, and i don't want to harp on this too much but the seeds of not taking that advice and censoring were were prevalent in a way that maybe uh, it may it certainly probably happened after you left the administration, but during the Bush times, where you know I was part of a group of of it turned out at that time initially sixty two scientists, there were twenty Nobel laureates, nineteen National Medal of Science winners, four former science advisors that were concerned about the Bush administration's manipulation of science, and um. It is a precursor of what I'm seeing in in spades now with 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 the with the with the, the Trump administration, the clear removal of scientists from advisory boards, replacing them with lobbyists, the denial, the simply denial of statements that scientists are making, or in the denial of reality, which is somewhat the same, 
I remember when I remember writing about the fact when George when W. Bush talked about missile defense and said we have a we'll have a missile defense you know in place this year and and we never had had we hadn't had a single test of a missile defense system that ever worked against any any missile with a realistic countermeasure. We we didn't have a missile defense system. I used to say we should just pretend we do because it's just as effective as saying we do and it's a lot less expensive. But this is what 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 that group wrote. Successful application of science has played a large part in the policies that have made the United States of America the world's most powerful nation and its citizens increasingly prosperous and healthy. Although scientific input to government is rarely the only factor in public policy decisions, this input should also be weighed from an objective and impartial perspective to avoid perilous consequences. Indeed, this principle has long been adhered to by presidents and administrations of both parties in forming and implementing policies. The administration of George W. Bush has, however, disregarded this principle. When scientific knowledge has been found to be in conflict with its political goals, the administration has often manipulated the process through which science enters into its decisions. This has been done by placing people who are professionally unqualified or who have clear conflicts of interest in official posts and on scientific advisory committees, by disbanding existing advisory committees, by censoring and suppressing reports by the government's own scientists, and by simply not seeking independent scientific advice. Now, we could go into that, and I and if we'd had more time, I'd go into case studies. But of course, th that is precisely what we're seeing now. And a, and a huge, in my mind as a scientist, a huge part of the problem of the Trump administration is, because I think of science more broadly as an empirical investigation of reality supplemented by rationality. That's what I think yeah. of science and, and you, testing. You said something earlier on, and I think this may be, the, you said, it's the job of scientists to provide advice and the politicians should take advice. Well, not take the and advice, but they you should. should follow, but, and, 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 you know, one of the thing about advice is it's not compulsory. It's uh, no, but and, but what's really important is you don't do. I agree with you. You can ignore the advice, and or but that's all right. But and, what you don't and, do, and you know what, I, I will tell you, I am unshocked. So, supposing the um, politician has a problem that uh, where we have to decide: build the dam here or build the dam there, mm -hmm. and there are costs and benefits, and the costs and benefits that are available to the scientists and of interest to the scientists point to one answer. And the costs and benefits that are of interest to the politician point to the other answer. I am unshocked not only that the politician would choose the answer that makes more sense to the politician than the scientist. Wait, wait. I am unshocked they would say, and that report we have from our scientists that points out that, uh, that gives uh, aid and comfort to our political opponents and will embarrass us at the convention, the, when the election, we're just going to put that in the shredder. I'm, I'm unshocked by that. I get, uh, I, and I don't think that's censorship. I think no. the point is that, you know, you, you're the client, you paid for a work product. Uh, the work product will be embarrassing. You made a decision for, no, so long as you've made them for non-pathological reasons. And, uh, but what, and but the, what the was done, what, what, was, what, what, what I'm worried about now, and I'm sure you're equally worried about it, is removing experts from panels and replacing yes, them by non-experts. That's a different thing. Well, that's uh, not, no, but that was what exactly, to them. that's what exactly happened in, 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 over and over again in, in, in issues related from from stem cell research to to uh, to climate change. In fact, uh, drafts were removed from government reports. Connections were that showed there was no, you know, even ethical and religious connections. Like there's no connection between abortion and breast cancer. Removed. And and I, I have a whole list here of important people, Nobel Prize winners, and others who were removed from policy committees. And that's what what, what we were objecting to at the time. And I just want to point it out that it's it it, it it is qualitatively and quantitatively different than what's happening now. But I worry that it was part of a continuum yeah. right. that developed to now. And let's let's talk about now. I don't. I mean, I don't want to have yeah. the argument. I mean, because we'll, you yeah. know, we can have that one time over beer. But but um, let's talk about we're in this situation now. And I want I want to respect your time and try and end. You've listed, I think I listed eight proposals of realistic things. Not getting rid of the electrical college, but but um, let's just go through them in maybe a minute apiece, okay? Um, okay. okay. Campaign finance. Yes, uh, I don't think that's one that I pay less attention to than other people because I think the problem the problem there is um, money's hydraulic. When you have extremely unequal um, concentrations of wealth, the money is going to flow into the political system. So I, I think that's a little bit the wrong place for people to put energy. 
Getting rid of the filibuster. That's an easy win. Uh, the filibuster is a rule of the Senate. It's not a law. Um, it, it's been modified often in the past. Most recently, uh, we eliminated the filibuster for judges. Um, this is the legislative filibuster. I say the first thing, order of business, because otherwise the American majority will never be a Senate majority. Exactly. I think I, we, I planned a whole 20 minutes talking about the uh, you make a very strong case that it's in the interest of the of the Republican Party right now to try and ensure that elections aren't fair, at least or representative, because if they are, they're going to lose. And I would say as a Republican that, that right now, Republicans have bad incentives and they need to, for their own sake, build themselves better incentives um, that it, you, you, it will be a stronger party in the long term. Once it understands its job is to compete for votes, not to suppress votes. Okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, well, we'll get to uh, statehood for D.C., you say, is a tri- uh, any mm-hmm. achievable thing. Uh, for the residential areas of D.C., um, in, the, in the Constitution, it says there must be a federal district in D.C. It can be no more than 10 miles square, but it doesn't say, it doesn't set a minimum. So you, you could put it around where all the federal office buildings are on the mall, and Congress would have exclusive jurisdiction there, but the residential areas you, you can make a state out of. The state would have more people than Vermont and Wyoming. Very soon, it will have more people than um, Alaska and North Dakota. It's certainly richer than any of those places and contributes more to the federal treasury. Um, and it would go far toward balancing the Senate, making sure that um, tiny little rural populations do not have two-thirds of the seats in the U.S. Senate. One thing people ask about, um, what about Puerto Rico? And I said, well, I don't have a principled objection to Puerto Rico. I, I, my sense of the votes there is, and it shows that about 55% are in favor of statehood. And with the Quebec and Catalonia precedents in mind, I think that's not enough. That uh, if on the day that Puerto Rico votes 80% to be a state, that's a different conversation. But 55, it just stows, stores trouble. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned it, but voting rights. Um, it, Restoring voting rights. Do you want to add yeah. to anything you said before? George W. Bush signed the reauthorization of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, uh, but the Supreme Court took out parts of it in 2013. The court's decision was not crazy. The, the court decision against those sections, the Civil right, Voting Rights Act said, this act creates special scrutiny of places that had bad voting practices before 1965. How is that rational in the world of 2013? And indeed, the court was right, because one of the places that got special scrutiny under the Voting Rights Act was Hawaii, which is a good actor. And one of the places that did not get special scrutiny was Wisconsin, which is the worst actor north of the Mason-Dixon line. So the Supreme Court said, the Congress, go and rewrite this law and base it on some more rational basis than voting behavior before 1965. And I think at this point, Congress should accept that invitation. And say right that you know maybe uh, maybe you should have one voting rights act that applies everywhere. Speaking of voting rights, in the current con- situation, which you you wrote this before it became a more urgent issue, mail in ballots, um, mm-hmm. uh, voting by mail. What I'm still amazed at the um, that this is can be actually made an issue in those parts of the country where people have always voted by. I've always voted by mail in most yeah. in the states I've lived in. Um, here's a, there's a valid concern about more voting by mail, which is, um, or the concern that seems to be me valid, which is it shortens the election and it means the people who vote by mail, uh, something will happen in the last week, the last two weeks, the last three weeks, the last month, and they're, they are voting without that information. And so one of the arguments is, and, and parties often plan to have closing arguments, um, and the voting by mail person is denied the, the, the closing argument. Uh, that said, I think the people who vote by mail are people who are the most committed to their vote. Yeah. Uh, and you're probably not going to change their minds. Um, really, I think, uh, I think so, you're the only person I've ever heard who thinks that the electoral pro- the pro- the election process is sh- too short in the United States. No, no, but what, what, what I mean is that things happen in the yeah, last week. I know, and I voting, understand. Voting I, I don't mean. have the benefit of those. So that's, I, I think that's a That's, that's a an important issue. But, but, but it, speaking of short and long, it, I wanted to make the contrast. You and I both grew up in a country that had a parliamentary electoral system. And again, it was in something I planned to spend 15, 15 or 20 minutes in terms of representative government, a parliamentary system versus the the republic system with a, an executive and a uh, a congress, um, what choice was that? of evils. Yeah, I know. It, well, it, I wanted to. So, so, but there are there are certain representative advantages to a parliamentary system. You would agree? This is a huge topic, um, um, obviously. So, and, may, and, and and it's also it's also 
I think not worth a lot of mental energy because okay, okay. The, the the decision was made more than 200 years ago. Okay, but the, let me, but, the, but the let thing me. That, the, the one thing that the United States could learn and should learn, in my opinion, from parliamentary systems is it needs to have a, a more of a professional civil service. And the, the pandemic has, has brought the cost home of having so many political appointees in places where political appointees don't belong. Yeah, that was one of the further things you pointed about is making it more professional. You start with the judicial system, making it, depoliticizing the judicial system. But you talk about, you know, in, in all areas of the bureaucracy, we should have civil servants. And you're right. That is one area where I, I don't know whether we're unique, but as far I don't know if it's a property of parliamentary systems, but in parliamentary system, everyone essentially below the minister is a, yeah. is a career civil servant. And uh, and that it, is, it, could, it, could, it could be the case here. This is a, 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 a historical inheritance of the American government um, that basically basically through much of the 19th century, literally everybody in federal and state government was a political appointee, including the messengers, including the people in the yeah, telegraph yeah, offices. Sure. Um, people are often amazed at how high voting turnout was in the 1880s. Well, one reason was uh, everyone knew that Uncle Jack would lose his job as a messenger if the other guys won, so that the family got interested. Um, and then since the 1880s, the federal government and the states have steadily shrunk the proportion of the government that is, uh, and actually the theory of American government is the rule is that people are appointed politically. The exceptions are that they're appointed for a civil service, but those, the exceptions have been growing and growing and growing. Um, the, the, they stopped growing in about the 1970s. And I think we need a new period where the president now appoints about 10,000 people. I think this would be a better and happier country if the president appointed 1,500 people. Okay, no, I, it's something I completely agree with. In that regard, in terms of voting rights and, and to some extent, well, jumping back a second, my wife uh, worked for the government of Australia and, and is Australian as well as American. There you're fined if you don't vote. You have to vote by mail in yeah. general, and you're fined if you don't vote. So the bucks, voting is right? 100%. Like not, Was that? Not a mean, it's, ten, it's a symbolic fine. It's $10, right? It's no, not it's about a, $60, but it's, but, it's, yeah. but it's still, I mean, it's not trivial. But what do you think about that? It seems to me... That if paying taxes is a civic obligation in a in a society in I, which you have a yeah, social contract, I, I've never get, that not voting I, I, is irresponsible. Is I've in fact given, then should I, be I, fined. I, I have never given that enough thought to have an opinion about it. I think it's a really. When I heard about it, I thought, "Wow, what's wrong? What's the downside of that?" And of course, people would say people should have a in the United States, which is based on rights. People should have a right not to vote. I'm going to, but people don't have a right not to pay taxes if they make money. But anyway, yeah. gerrymandering. You said. Yeah, um, that's gotten much worse uh, since 2010, and it is an artifact of the, Repu the incredible Republican wins in the year 2010, which also was a census year and enabled redistricting in 2011. Parties used to, there used to be some restraint on gerrymandering, both by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and also by the deterrence between the parties. But the Republicans had such an advantage after 2010 that they just they were undeterred. So I. Um, I, in an ideal world, uh, politicians would not draw their own boundaries. That is a bigger reform than I can imagine happening soon in the United States, and certainly won't happen in 2021. Uh, so I recommend restoring deterrence by um, Democrats in the Democratic states drawing two maps for their state, a competitive map and an uncompetitive, saying, if you in Georgia will draw a fair map, we here in North Carolina will draw a fair map. If you don't, we won't. Um, and, but let's, and then try to create a, a sense that um, while that subject to protecting racial minorities under a new Voting Rights Act, that you're trying to make as many competitive districts as possible, not as few competitive districts as possible. Okay, now there's there's um, there are two other things which are big issues, and so I want to try and talk about them as briefly as possible, but you bring them up and they're vital, and it would be a, a shame not to at least mention them. One large part of, of the book, in some sense, we talk about how you can lose to Trump, Involves wokeness. Um, hmm. Involves the the the. Um, uh, there's a great uh, quote which I would search through for my papers if I had them at this point, um, where you basically say that okay, um, requesting things becomes demands and demands becomes implementation, and that that the the electorate that you're trying to reach. In the, a large part of the people who didn't vote in this country or who might be have their votes changeable are not receptive to this idea that we have to legit, legit, sort of legislate in every way mm -hmm. um, personal conduct. 
yeah. and we refuse to and we and we cancel and we uh but you have a great statement about how the legislators in the 60s, 50s or 60s were people that may have been alcoholics, may have been this or that, but they managed to get a lot done. Um, and by legislating personal ethics and condemning anyone who disagrees, well, I, platform I'm not was- concerned. This is not exactly about political extremism. This is about a different thing. Um, I, I had a friend who worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016 and was struck by focus groups where working class people, white and black, talked about political correctness as a problem. And what are they talking about? I mean, you know, and, and I, in the book, I quote lots of surveys and data about how people complain about this. And uh, what my friend explained, and I tried to explain in the book is, these were people, often women, who were afraid that if their husband, who had a year or two of formal, of a four-year education, made a joke that middle-class people didn't like, that he would lose his job and the family would be ruined. And that they experienced what they called political correctness and what I call wokeness as a form of policing mm -hmm. of the behavior of parts of the population by other parts of the population who were always changing the rules. Yeah. Um, and that they could never compete and that, and that they, and that terrible consequences hovered over them. And so what, you know, I, we saw this in the 20, 20 Democratic campaigns that the issues that the uh, um, that were supposed to sink Biden never did. You know, the question that uh, Biden was more touchy with women than modern educated women like. And some of his political, and by the way, more touchy than I would like um, and more touchy than I would be. Uh, but of course, I'm a product of the edu educated bourgeoisie. Those are not, are not our manners. Um, but other people said, I can see he's got a good heart. And even if he touched someone in a way they didn't like at that minute, I think he didn't mean any harm by it. I think he's got a good heart. And I don't want you pulling the walls on his head because you've got some set of new rules that were invented in Oberlin. And this guy who went to college shortly after the Civil War, Mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever it yeah. was. he hasn't you know he's too old and i'm too you know I, i'm not wealthy enough to know your rules leave us alone yeah and you point that out i found i found one of the quotes which was interesting from the 2018 election gallup asked democrats and republicans to choose their top voting concerns and democrats 87 percent selected health care which we'll get to next it's a big issue but we'll spend five minutes on it and and it was tied equally with, quote, the way women are treated in American society. Those were the two big issues in 2018 in a world with, with a lot of problems. Whereas the Republicans, 84% selected immigration, and it was second only the economy at 85%. And you were pointing out the, the, um, the dichotomy there. If you focus on, on, on the issues which aren't relevant to the people who might vote to you, and those are woke issues, in this case, the way women are treated by the economy, by, by, by in society, you may have a problem. Now, do, but one thing that I don't think you said, but I, want, I assume you presume this, it seems to me, at least, and most people I know, is that, is that this wokeness is in some sense a response out of frustration that we're seeing so prevalent now in every area of society where where Jimmy Fallon is has to apologize for impersonating Chris Rock, who's black, and and yeah. and how do you you know and by by blackface? Well, so I think that, 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 hold on, let me finish. That it's a response yeah. to Trump. It's a response of frustration to people saying Trump epitomizes all of the bad behavior, and he never got punished, and we want to we want to punish someone. Yeah. So I don't know whether that's well. I talk about this in the book. To, 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 the extent you can measure wokeness, which is a, diff, a minimal extent, but the extent you can, the decisive year seems to be two thousand and fourteen, mm -hmm. um, and. I agree that some of the things we would call our responses, the Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the, the revival of Black Lives Matter, it was, it was, there was a first round one in 2014 after Ferguson. Um, these are responses to cruelties and injustices, and in some senses, they're they are welcome. Um, but I think there's another thing which is going on, which is um, that the advent of social media has created new kinds of communities, and it's created, in effect, new kinds of religious observers. So wokeness is also a revival of the American Puritan tradition, um, which was always, a, which Puritanism was about upper class people policing lower class people. And um, an obscure point, you know, uh, but it's sort of telling. Um, 
America, Donald Trump says we're saying Merry Christmas again. Uh, I don't know how, how it was in your part of Toronto. I, I grew up in a world in which people said Happy Christmas. And in the British Isles, people say Happy Christmas. Why? What's the difference between Happy Christmas and Merry Christmas? Well, Merry Christmas is a, is a much older phrase that included a connotation of drinking and having sex. And the, the Christmas holiday, as it was known in England in the six, one of the reasons in the 1600s, had a lot of, because it was the quietest time of the year, the nights were longest, a lot of getting drunk and having sex. And that's one of the reasons the Puritans hated it so much. Um, so the, the Puritans ultimately lose, and the war on Christmas is given up, and the upper classes accept that there will be Christmas. But beginning in the 19th century, the middle classes say, it has to be a little bit less, less drinking and less sex, please. And so they converted the word Mary with its connotations of those things, which is something you would say in, you know, God rest ye merry gentlemen. You know, the, the, the merry gentlemen are drunken gentlemen. Uh, but, uh, uh, they began about 1820, 1830, it became more polite, more refined to say happy Christmas with none of those connotations. Um, and indeed, Christmas became, you know, a different kind of holiday. Um, something like that is going on now where, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to, cl- um, educated people are trying to clean up the behavior of others. And, and they're often right. Um, you know, uh, do not comment certain comments you shouldn't make good, but it's also true that some of us are quicker to figure these things out than others. And the people who are slower to figure them out feel it's not a fair game. Well, I mean, and it reaches as, I mean, all these things have a pendulum, but I, I'll, the one example I think of the, uh, the, I think it was the Philadelphia Inquirer. The editor had to remove because, because they were talking about the effects of of the protests on urban landscapes. And there was an article that happened to say buildings matter too. And that, as you know, that editor had to be removed because of that statement. And it seems to me that's a kind of extreme, um, yeah. extremism, which is which. And in fact, the wary area. I've tried to thought of how I've come closer to you, as I know you've come closer to me. And it seems to me right now. The right, or at least the conservatives, are on the right side of free speech. Then the left I, I, is not. I, I, I think free speech is not the way I conceptualize it because um, free speech refers to your ability to say things without punishment by the law. Um, what, what we people are experiencing are social consequences for activities and, and, and some, uh, for speeches, for speech, and things that are not speech light. I, I, I think. What, what I'm hopeful, and this is the end of the book, um, and maybe a good place to, to wrap up, is that what Trump could do for us that is good is he's made many forms of cruelty visible and has prompted a reaction. Yeah. And the challenge for all of us, and since the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, emotions are very running very strong. As the emotions return to more normal currents, to channel those impulses into constructive courses that lead to less cruelty, not to more petty tyranny. Uh, well, how can you disagree with that? L- the last thing, which we won't have time before we get to the end, which is a, a, a proposal you make, which is incredibly important and occupies a lot of a lot of time in this book, and importantly, is one actually we agree about half of. Um, you, you point out that the, the next president, if they're going to achieve anything, if it, you point out you have to do what's achievable if you if you want to make government workable and get beyond all the problems that we're going to have after after Trump is president. The next president is going to have a huge number of problems. If you don't achieve anything, you some then then you're going to be blamed for it in some sense. And the two things that you point out, you you suggest a trade off. You agree as I do that healthcare in this country is in a miserable state and you spend a tremendous amount of time and I'm not doing justice now. I'm happy to if you want to spend another half hour, but um. But at the same time, you say the trade-off is that we that so the, so liberals, if you want to call it that, get health care, but they have to give in on immigration. The, the conservatives have to give in on health care if they want to get immigration. Do you you want to spend three minutes parsing well, that? I, I think one of my big master ideas in the two Trump books is um, the thing that makes authoritarian nationalism possible is people don't feel their country's looking out for them. The way it should. Yes, and we have to. And the country is all there is. There's really nothing else. And it's maybe not the ideal way to organize human affairs. It's what we've got. So my 
master ideas. We need to make nationhood mean something more. And that means both tighter connections within nations and then clear distinctions between nations in ways that do not cause conflict, that do not invite great power competition, and that don't invite xenophobia, that don't invite protectionism. And so, you know, denser connections, higher boundaries. Uh, especially the movement of people. And so I I see those two things as related. The the, the stronger healthcare system binds citizens together more closely. And stricter immigration means that the distinction citizen and non-citizen is clearer and more meaningful. Obviously, I think you're absolutely right. You make a big point that in other countries, the healthcare system binds people. And uh, several brilliant points that that I I can't help but mention, even if it takes longer, just of yours that I thought were very interesting. One is that it automatically makes an us versus them mentality because people don't want to cha- be in a position of having to have the crummy health care that other people have yeah. and they want to be in a privileged position and they want to they it, it automatically makes an us versus them thing but it also suppresses the innovation and of that is supposed to be the hallmark of capitalism that america has fewer creates fewer uh, self-employed individuals because you don't want to become self-employed because you lose your health care. That's a fascinating point, I think, that is really important. Yeah. If, uh, We've to all make... seen that, I'm sure, in many of the people we know. People yeah. have an idea, they've got a good job, they've got an idea, they want to take it on the road, but they worry, my kid's disabled, what happens to me? At the same time, the reason that resonated with me is there are also, however, lots of studies that show that immigrants are much more entrepreneurial, if you look at the history of it, are much more entrepreneurial than those who haven't, you know, those who have immigrated end up being well, much more well, that, entrepreneurial. So that, that, may be so a that there's a reason to encourage too, immigration. Be, if you're here illegally and you can't be in a job with health insurance anyway, then you take and you have an idea, then why not? Because it's not like you're going to get the health insurance if you you you, the, you don't have the option. But, but I mean, it's a reason to welcome immigrants, I guess is what I'm saying, is that ultimately you, you point out that the society can't afford to, uh, rightly so perhaps, provide health for everyone, including aliens. And you point out that Canada doesn't, as which is the paradigm of sort of goodness in my mind. Um, but at the same time, uh, these people are also doing the jobs that no one else wants to do. And they're getting the lower. The reason they can't afford the health care is they're doing the crappy jobs that other people don't want to do. And does society as a social contract in the Rosonian sense owe something in return to those people, I guess, is the question that I would is have. It- it's a question of numbers, um, and that's what I talk about in the book. It's not a, immigration is not a binary thing where it's, it's yeah. good or bad. It's um, there, there, there. Are, there's a question of optimality. One statement you make about um, you, you say you do not be Trump. This is on the last two pages of the book before the. You say you do not be Trump until you've restored an America that has room for all its people, and then there's. I'll skip a little bit of it, um, and you say, and I, I found this so poignant that I tweeted it after the after the George Floyd incident. You said, after the protest there, you say, build a world that does not have room for millions of your fellow citizens, and they will burn it down rather than let you enjoy it without them. Maybe you cannot bring everyone along with you, but you must still try for your own sake as well as theirs. I mean, yes. th- that is what we're seeing in some sense is the reaction. The, the, that's, what say, that's people what would say is extreme. Right. It's just, I, and it was prescient. You wrote it before it happened, but, but what happened? George Floyd is an exact example because people perceive they're living in a world that doesn't have room for them for whatever reason, and they don't want to burn it down. And we can't, we can't pardon acts of violence and crime, but we can understand it at least. And and I thought that was right. a very, and, and if we then, want to, and, and in fact, if we want to stop it. We really have to understand it. Exactly. If we want to stop it, we have to understand it. And I think that's a really important lesson from your book. And then the last one is the quote from, from Lincoln, which is that yes. human nature will not change. In any future great national trial, compared with men of this, we shall have weak and as strong, as silly and as wise, as bad and good. Let us therefore study the incidents of this as philosophy to learn wisdom from. And none of them is wrongs to be revenged. And I think that is the most important moral lesson of of the book. And to me, the conversation we have had is a demonstration of that. The the reaction of the people who didn't want me to have you on is the reaction of revenge instead of understanding, is the reaction of let's have an intelligent conversation and try and learn and discuss so we can both with the same goals of producing a better world. And And I thank you 
profoundly for taking your time to do that as well thank as for, I love for continuing story. to write. Well, thank you for just re reading that quote. I just, I, I've always, it's not a, one of his most famous quotes. It's one that I found always one of the most moving. Uh, um, you know, it's funny. Twitter is such a, a negative thing. I tweeted that because I liked it so much. And all these people wrote, it's not one of his best quotes. <laughs> it's not one of his best speeches. <laughs> and I thought, damn, you know, that's the world we live in. Anyway, thank you, David. It's It's been a, a thank wonderful... You. I hope you enjoyed it. It, it has been it. great. You are you are such a mental athlete. I, I'm struggling to keep up with you. And it's, oh it's, well, it's, uh, uh, it's 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 it goes both ways. But thank you, thank you very much. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, John and Don Edwards, Gus and Luke Holwerda, and Rob Zepps. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects, and music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash origins podcast.